and just be at the square hearing. Okay. This budget hearing will now come to order. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Alika Samuel, Chair of the Committee on Public Housing, and we are here to conduct a preliminary budget hearing on NYCHA's five year operating and capital plans for 2018 to 2022. I would first like to thank my co chair, Council Member Vanessa Gibson, who will be giving opening remarks and acknowledge that I am joined today, that we are joined today by Council Members Ayala, Gradenchik, Council Member Ruben Diaz Sr., Council Member Rosenthal, Council Member Levin, Council Member Torres, Council Member Traeger, Council Member Richards, Council Member Salamanca, Council Member Levin and Council Member Mario. NYCHA has operated the largest public housing program in the nation for over 75 years, providing affordable housing to over 400,000 low and moderate income city residents. Despite budgetary challenges and funding shortfalls across all levels of government, NYCHA continues to address the varied physical needs across its aging buildings, offer community and senior programming at 255 community centers and pursue strategies to address structural funding deficits. Central to NYCHA's goal of achieving financial solvency is Next Generation NYCHA, a 10-year strategic action plan that was launched in May of 2015. The plan applies targeted strategies to get NYCHA on a solid financial ground and reduce NYCHA's deficit by more than $1 billion over the next five years. While next-gen strategies are projected to generate $182 million in revenue in 2018, this is not enough to offset the $1.3 billion federal operating shortfall NYCHA has faced from 2001 to 2016. This is in addition to NYCHA's cumulative federal capital subsidy loss, which currently totals $1.4 billion. From fiscal years 2018 to 2022, the city is currently allocating about $225 million in operating funds to NYCHA and about $1.4 billion in capital funds for roofs, heating systems, and other critical building system improvements. These resources are critical to NYCHA, but it is not enough. Given that this current president in Washington, D.C.'s fiscal 2019 budget proposal eliminates the Public Housing Capital Fund, a $346 million reduction in NYCHA's budget, and would significantly reduce the Public Housing Operating Fund, a $330 million reduction in NYCHA's budget, and the Section 8 program, a $124 million reduction in NYCHA's budget, NYCHA's financial situation looks dire, totaling $600 million in budget reductions. Put simply, NYCHA has been in a financial crisis, which is likely to continue to be exacerbated under the current federal administration and requires immediate action. The Council will continue our commitment to fund vital programs and capital improvements at NYCHA and will seek new opportunities to strengthen these partnerships. And with questions around how NYCHA spend and manages its budget, we hope to glean a clearer sense of how NYCHA plans to absorb the proposed federal cuts and how this will impact its operations and service levels. I would like to thank the NYCHA Chair and CEO, Shola Olatoye, and her staff for joining us today and for their collaborative work with the City Council. And I look forward to hearing from the administration during this hearing this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our chair of the Housing Authority and to all the members of the public. I welcome each and every one of you to the City Council. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson of the 16th District in the Borough of the Bronx. 
and I'm proud to serve as the chair of the newly formed subcommittee on the capital budget. I want to thank my fellow co-chair, Councilmember Alika Amprey samuel chair of the Committee on Public Housing, and all of my colleagues who are here. I want to thank my subcommittee members. We are a small but tight group. Councilmember Barry Gradenchik, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, and Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. And thank you for joining us today. This afternoon, the subcommittee is joining with the Committee on Public Housing to hear testimony from our CEO and chair, Shola Olatoye, chair of the city's housing authority, which serves nearly 400,000 low and moderate income New Yorkers, is truly an essential component of our city's commitment to providing affordable housing to our families. We've read a lot recently about who is responsible for the issues that are faced by the housing authority and who is held accountable for addressing them. I will say that beyond all of the political gamesmanships and all of the conversations that we've had lies a fundamental truth. NYCHA residents are suffering. They were suffering yesterday, they're suffering today, and unless we get our acts together, they will suffer tomorrow. This is a result of years of underinvestment and poor allocation of resources. And both the state of New York and the city of New York must step their game up and demonstrate real leadership to effectuate change. This winter, 320,000 residents experienced a loss of heat or hot water for a time while awaiting the replacements of outdated, broken, and malfunctioning boilers. For years, tenants have reported issues with mold, lead paint, and leaky roofs. These conditions, we all agree, are unacceptable. To the administration's credit, it has made substantial and unprecedented investments in structural improvements and exterior capital work. Over 70% of NYCHA's capital plan, $3.7 billion, will support these efforts. The administration has pledged a $200 million investment for heating system improvements at 20 of our developments and $645.4 million or half of all city funded commitments for roof repairs. Investments will not be effective unless they are truly coupled with reforms to NYCHA's capital process. It's great to have the allocation and the commitment of money, but the process has to change. NYCHA's capital commitment rate, which was only 22% in 2017, is significantly below the city's average of 56%. Earlier today, I had a hearing with DEP. Their commitment rate for last year, 78%. So we certainly know we can do a lot better. NYCHA residents must be confident that the repairs are done in a timely fashion and they cannot afford to wait, particularly when the health, the safety, and well-being of families is at risk. It is clear that we must do a better job completing projects as expeditiously as possible. That is why I joined with many of my colleagues in the city council yesterday. We went to Albany to talk to many of our colleagues in the state legislature, and we are supportive of the bill that was introduced by Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty and passed by the Assembly on Monday that would grant NYCHA the ability to use design build. This would speed up not just boiler work, but also many other necessary repair and capital projects. I'm encouraged that the governor has been open to giving NYCHA this authority, and certainly we want to urge the Senate to join with the governor and the assembly to get this done as soon as possible. I also want to commend the Housing Authority for yesterday's launch and announcement of a new capital tracker, finally, which will increase accountability and allow the public to find out more information about the status of NYCHA projects. NYCHA must ensure that this tracker provides accurate, comprehensive information that can really provide true transparency about the $1 billion in NYCHA capital contracts. Finally, I must note, and this is a sad note, that the city has to address the challenges and recognize what we are facing 
in the environment of this federal government, this hostile federal government that does not support public housing. It is a reality that we are facing and is a reality that we have to acknowledge. This president's proposed budget would reduce funding for HUD by over 18 percent, which would significantly impact the funds that are received by the city of New York. These proposed cuts to the public housing capital fund are $346 million at a time when funds are critical to NYCHA's efforts to maintain quality affordable housing. So this afternoon, I hope to hear from NYCHA about its plans and ongoing efforts to address the gaps that we face and certainly the impact that these cuts are going to have on ensuring that the agency is able to operate. No New Yorker should suffer the indignity of living in substandard and unsafe housing. We owe it to 400,000 New Yorkers that live in public housing, their families and their children, to find solutions, be creative, expedite a process, fix our capital system, and do better. It's as simple as that, but certainly hard to achieve. So I look forward to this afternoon's conversation and certainly joining my chair. NYCHA knows that this city council has always been supportive. Locally, myself and many of my colleagues, we give thousands and thousands and millions of dollars to NYCHA to provide security measures, enhanced lighting, upgrades to playground, and the list goes on and on. And we will continue to do that because it is important. We just can't talk the talk, we have to walk the walk, and we have to do our part and make sure that this is a collective partnership. So I want to acknowledge the finance team who did tremendous work to today's hearing, our finance director, Latanya McKinney, our deputy directors, Nathan Told and Regina Pareda Ryan, our finance head, Chima Obichair, our finance analyst, Sarah Gastelum, and our finance counsels, Eric Bernstein to my left, and Rebecca Chasen. I want to thank you all for being here to all of my colleagues, and I look forward to this afternoon's conversation. And now I'll turn this back over to my chair, Chair Amprey Samuel. Thank you. We have just been joined by Council Member Van Bramer and Council Member Menchaca. Thank you. Um, and now I welcome the Do you affirm that your testimony is truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairs Alika Ampri Samuel and Vanessa Gibson, members of the Committee on Public Housing and Subcommittee on Capital Budget, and the other distinguished members of the City Council. I'm Shola Olatoye, Chair and CEO of the New York City Housing Authority. I'm pleased to be joined by Acting General Manager, Manager Vito Mastachulo, Deborah Goddard, Executive Vice President for Capital Projects. Tricia Roberts, Vice President for Finance, and other members of the NYCHA executive team. Thank you for this opportunity to present the authority's adopted budget, which was approved by the NYCHA Board of Commissioners on December 20th, 2017. This month marks my fourth year as NYCHA's chair and CEO. I took on this role to improve the quality of life for residents, reset relationships, and stabilize the agency's finances. To do that, we developed Next Generation NYCHA, the Authority's 10-year strategic plan and turnaround effort. With it, we've been able to balance NYCHA's operating budget for three years in a row, build up our reserves, launch the largest development program in our history, and improve quality of life for residents through innovative federal programs like the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program and Energy Performance Contracts. For four years, I've discussed NYCHA's dire financial state, including its enormous capital needs and the $3 billion loss in federal operating and capital funding since 2001. We are a federally funded agency, and federal underfunding remains the number one threat to public housing across the nation. While we are operating under a two-year federal budget agreement, we do not know what our specific allocations from HUD will be in the years 2018 and 2019. 
The president's proposed 2018 budget makes it painfully obvious that the federal government seeks to fully abandon public housing and that it wants local governments as well as residents through a rent hike to make up for this disinvestment. But as I've said, we will not let DC walk away from its responsibilities. The stakes are simply too high for the one in 14 New Yorkers who call NYCHA home, the teachers and police officers, seniors and veterans who are the backbone of our great city. We will not turn our backs, but it will require bold and unpopular shifts in how we do business. Before I take you through some of the accomplishments we've, been, we've made despite these challenges, I'd like to discuss our projected operating revenues and expenses. I will also discuss our capital budget later in the testimony. In 2018, NYCHA expects to receive approximately 20 to 23 percent of the public housing operating funding appropriated by Congress for all public housing authorities based on historical trends. This is $108 million less than we are eligible to receive because HUD rations or prorates the limited federal funds it allocates to all of the public housing authorities across the country. With total revenue of $3.3 billion and expenses of $3.3 billion, we are projecting a slight surplus of $12 million for 2018. Two of our largest expenditures are employee benefits and utilities, for which we are budgeting $572 million and $544 million in 2018, respectively. These are all, there are also expenses, these are also the expenses most out of our control. Even with the central office headcount going down by more than 1,000 over the past decade due to attrition and transfers to other city agencies, our health care and pension costs have gone up by $185 million during that same period, a 51% increase. The cost of utility, utilities is also variable and unpredictable. Our largest source of revenue includes rent from residents and federal operating funding. But the money we receive from the federal government and collect in rent are not enough to cover our costs as a landlord. After combining rent and federal operating funds, there's still a $268 per unit annual deficit. And there's been an increase in chronic rent delinquency at NYCHA, much of which can be attributed to the HUD mandated flat rent increases. Nearly 95,000 households saw their rent go up by an average of 46% or some $200 a month since January 2014. Under the current policies, residents pay 30% of their adjusted income towards rent, which factors in certain deductions and expenses. If the president's draconian vision comes to pass and residents' rent is raised to 35% of their gross income, we expect a negative impact to our rent collection rate because residents won't be able to afford a 33% rent increase. We rely on the federal government, government for nearly two-thirds of our funding. As I mentioned, for 2018, we expect to receive 20 to 23% of the public housing operating funding appropriated by Congress. But under the president's vision, our operating funds would be slashed by more than a third. Currently, for our Section 8 program, we expect a funding proration rate of 95% this year, along with a $6.5 million cut to the funds for, for running the program. Although we do not anticipate a Section 8 program deficit in 2018, if the final federal budget results in more cuts, we would have to stop issuing turnover vouchers. If the President's proposed Section 8 proration rate of 88% is enacted, we would lose nearly 10,000 existing Section 8 vouchers. It is more imperative that f than ever for us to rally against the federal government's starvation of public housing. Since its release nearly three years ago, Next Generation NYCHA has served as a critical roadmap for fundamentally changing the way we do business at the authority. Turnaround efforts take time, but I think we can all agree that we want to keep moving forward. Put simply, the more revenue we have, the more we can do to support our residents' quality of life. Since 2015, NYCHA has achieved more than $313 million in savings from next-gen initiatives. That includes the mayor's relief of payments to the city, $84 million, reduced central office costs, $47 million, 
converting formerly unfunded units built by the city and the state to a Section 8 funding stream, $16 million, RAD at Ocean Bay, $44 million, and our public-private partnerships involving six Section 8 developments, $108 million. And by reducing the number of central office staff by more than 600, we've been able to add 239 frontline positions. Improving our operations is another way we can serve residents better and another crucial aim of NextGen NYCHA. Before we launched our strategic plan, basic repairs took an average of 13 days to be completed. We've brought that down to four days. At our 56 next-gen operations sites, where we've empowered property managers with more control and accountability, basic repairs are being completed even faster. But if there are more cuts from Washington, it is unlikely we will be able to continue driving down repair times. Our next-gen NYCHA digital initiatives are also streamlining our operations. 3,700 employees, including maintenance, skilled trades, and emergency services staff are now equipped with smartphones, enabling them to open and close work orders while, resident, while getting residents sign off on the work on the spot. Using their smartphones, maintenance workers are completing 9% more work orders. Residents have used the My NYCHA mobile app to open more than a half million work orders since it was launched. Last year, we finished rolling out our online annual income certification to streamline the process for residents, and now office staff have more time to focus on other tasks. Through, next gen sustainability, uh, through the Next Gen Sustainability Agenda, NYCHA is reducing its carbon footprint, benefiting residents and the city at large. We brought recycling to all 325 developments, and we've started work on three large-scale energy performance contracts that will upgrade lighting and heating systems while reducing energy usage, part of an approximately $300 million initiative. Under the mayor's action plan, we've installed more than 6,200 security lights at 14 developments, which had the highest crime rates in 2014, with a more than $140 million investment from the city. And we're in the process of installing security cameras and high-tech building entry systems at all of these sites. Thanks to the City Council fiscal year 2017 funding, we installed about six, 560 security cameras and upgraded 38 cameras at 19 developments on time. Crime dropped more than 7% across NYCHA developments last year. Our capital budget includes three sources, federal funding from HUD, federal FEMA funding, and city funding. In recent years, HUD has provided NYCHA with about $3 million annually in federal capital funds. For 2018, we allocated about $222 million for roof and facade repairs, heating plant replacements, elevator rehabs, and bathroom renovations. If the president has his way and our federal capital funding is zeroed out, these vital projects will be halted at our aging buildings, 60% of which are more than a half a century old, and residents will suffer the consequences. While the federal capital funding re we receive is far from enough to meet our building's vast capital needs and has declined by a cumulative $1.6 billion since 2001, we're using the money we do receive as quickly and efficiently as possible to improve residents' quality of life. More than a billion dollars of construction work is currently underway across the authority. And the past four years, we've, co we've committed our federal capital grants within an average of 12 months, well ahead of HUD's 24-month obligation deadline, and spent the grants an average of 15 months ahead of the 48-month deadline. We completed our Bond B work ahead of schedule, about $500 million of major improvements at 319 buildings. By the end of 2017, we had awarded $1.8 billion in contracts as part of our historic FEMA grant to repair and strengthen 33 Sandy impacted developments. At that point, we had spent up $730 million of these funds and hired about 250 NYCHA residents in the process. In the next two years, we expect to spend approximately $1.7 billion on the Sandy Recovery and Resiliency Program. Residents are getting new roofs, 
electrical systems and boilers, backup power, and flood protection. We are addressing some of our building's most critical infrastructure issues thanks to Mayor de Blasio's support. He has committed an unprecedented level of resources to the authority, including $1.3 billion to fix nearly 1,000 roofs, millions to repair facades at over 400 buildings, and most recently, $200 million to replace boilers and upgrade heating systems at 20 developments. We completed roof replacements at 63 buildings and construction for the second set of buildings is on schedule to begin this May. We appreciate the extraordinary support from the mayor and this body, which is enhancing our capital projects going forward. However, city funds are not a replacement for HUD funding. So we must continue advocating for capital investment from the federal government, considering the massive needs any cuts to capital funding are unacceptable and have, have a severe and immediate impact on our residents. Recently, there has been a lot of attention on ways the state can further step up to help improve the quality of housing at NYCHA. The assembly is already leading the way by including $200 million in new capital funding to match the city's contribution and passing design build this week. The city has sought design build authority for years. It matters because it could shave a year or more off time it takes to replace much needed heating systems at NYCHA. Moreover, it would be helpful for the leadership at the state to release the $200 million allocated to NYCHA in last year's budget, commit $200 million in new capital dollars in this year's state budget, and to sign design build for all NYCHA projects into law. It's important to note that with the steady decline in federal capital dollars, NYCHA is pursuing innovative ways to fund the building and apartment upgrades that residents deserve. Last year, we closed on the largest single-site RAD transaction in the nation, bringing $325 million to repair and modernize 1,400 apartments at Ocean Bay Bayside in the Rockaways, home to 4,000 residents. That means new kitchens and bathrooms, new roofs, and state-of-the-art security and heating systems for residents. We selected developers for three new RAD bundles, which will raise $300 million for extensive repairs to an additional 1,700 apartments throughout the Bronx and Brooklyn. Our Next Gen Neighborhoods program is bringing desperately needed affordable housing to our city and revenue for building upgrades at NYCHA. To date, we've announced four sites where this vital program will create a 50-50 mix of affordable and market rate housing on underutilized land. Holmes Towers, Wyckoff Gardens, LaGuardia Houses, and Cooper Park Houses. This represents more than 750 new affordable housing apartments currently in the pipeline. Our work to support residents goes beyond the foundations of an affordable home. We also connect residents to life-changing opportunities. Since the launch of NextGen NYCHA, our Office of Resident Economic Empowerment and Sustainability and partners have facilitated more than 8,200 resident job placements and over 19,000 connections to services. Through job training, union apprenticeship programs, and business courses, we are providing residents with many pathways to opportunity. And we're engaging people in, a new, in new and different ways with 14 new youth councils, dedicated engagement on our real estate development activities, and thanks to the city council, our recently launched Resident Leadership Academy. While Next Generation, with Next Generation NYCHA as our guide, we are strengthening our organization and improving the quality of life for residents. But decades of disinvestment don't come undone overnight and there is no NYCHA ferry waiting in the wings to rescue us. Put simply, we need a sustainable financial model. Our residents deserve it. Come to the table to help us address the challenges. We cannot solve them on our own, and stand with us as we urge DC and Albany to provide public housing with funding and resources it needs. We are home to 600,000 people, a population greater than Atlanta. The stakes are too high for us to be divided when the Trump administration's fiscal threats remain. Last year, we came together as partners, elected officials, residents, and advocates to make the case for public housing, and we will fight tirelessly again this year. We appreciate the support we've received from the mayor, city council, and other city agencies for our next-gen NYCHA initiatives. This assistance is critical. While city funding can supplement 
but cannot replace HUD funding. We encourage council members to allocate more funds for capital projects that will improve resident quality of life, like new boilers, elevators, and gas risers. And we ask that you stand with us as we urge Albany to pass design-build legislation that will enable us to complete major capital projects faster. There is more work to be done. Thank you for your support. We will take your questions now. Thank you. And we have also just been joined by Council Member Keith Powers. Yes. Then While the 2018 and 2022 adopted operating budget reflects a surplus that you mentioned, in the immediate term in 2018, the operating budget reflects a deficit of about 28.7 million in 2019 and deficits through 2022. Can you provide additional details on the major drivers that contribute to this long-term operating deficit? Sure. Um, first, if I, if I may, Madam Chair, just to go back, and I think my testimony, I misspoke. Um, HUD has provided us about $300 million a year in capital funding. I think I might have said three, so I just want to correct the record. Okay. Um, I, I'll start at a high level. Um, there are, as I mentioned in, in our testimony, um, there are there are some key drivers to our budget. Um, one is on the revenue side is the federal operating subsidy, which has been declining. Um, the other is our our resident rent, uh, which has also has also been declining. On the expense side. Uh, there are two large expense categories that are somewhat fixed. One is our personnel costs, and the other is utilities. Okay. You mentioned a decline in the rent collection. Can you let us know what the actual rent collection is for 2017 and what you projected in your um, budget? Sure, I'm going to ask uh, our Vice President of Finance, Tricia Roberts, to provide that answer. Based on the HUD uh, mandated uh, rent collection rate, in 2017, our collection rate is 92%. 92%? Yes, based on the HUD um, MMR rent collection rate. That rent collection rate takes into past due amounts, reoccurring charges, um, and other fees and credits that are due within that. Okay, okay. And um, I just have another question about the surplus. Do you factor in emergencies? Because I know the public constantly talk about the different like urgent issues that happen and come up. And with there being a $12 million surplus, that might sound like a certain figure to the public, but can you explain, um, like, do you put in a budget line at all for your emergencies? So I'll, I'll just, just take a step back and okay. say, as you know, you know, budgeting is both a, a, a in art, um, we use uh, some very basic, um, prudent approaches, which is one, looking at historicals um, and, and really making some conservative assumptions about what we can expect in terms of HUD funding, in terms of um, expenses. Uh, we, within our operations department, we have an emergency services department, and that is a department that is funded. Um, and, and the other thing to say here is it is a projected surplus. You know, NYCHA operates on a calendar fiscal year, mm -hmm. and so based on what we know in the fourth quarter of the previous year, these are projections. Um, and, and so that $12 million surplus is really projected in what our our hope is, in, in, as, we, as we budget, is that we are budgeting for those priorities um, based on historical and also things that we've outlined in our plan. Um, and so, uh, but again, we are funding our emergency services department as part of our operations. Okay, okay. Although the federal, although the future federal funding levels remain uncertain, it also represents a major shift in the federal government's role in subsidized housing. And the number of federally funded housing programs are slated for elimination, which you also discussed, or deep cuts, which would significantly impact NYCHA and negatively impact the vulnerable New Yorkers. Should the city be taking steps to ensure flexibility 
for the adjustment of current priorities to protect, pr to protect vulnerable populations in the event that these cuts actually happen? So we, we clearly have been working and, and watching what's happening in, in, in Washington very closely and coordinating with our colleagues in, in, here at, at City Hall and with the administration. Um, and, and we have to plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we, get the, when we have a better sense of what, what the reality is of some of these cuts, um, or proposed cuts, we absolutely need to, to be thinking about ways in which we can, can, while protecting a level of service to residents, make sure that we are um, planning appropriately, and that would include conversations with the city. Okay. And is the administration or your conversations with the city and the, and the administration considering any alternative sources of revenue to fund these critical needs citywide, such as the use of the annual surpluses from the Battery City, um, Battery Park City Authority? Have you had any conversations or? Right. So, so this, the, the, the use of the Battery Park City Authority um, uh, funds has been something that's been talked about a while and what I've said is, you know, one, those resources are currently committed, as I understand it, as part of the, the housing plan. And what we really, what we need, what NYCHA really needs is a, is a new and sustainable source of revenue. Um, so, you know, how those, you know, at that level, those are decisions that the mayor and, you know, his cabinet ultimately will be making. But I, I do believe that we need a new and, and, and long-term, you know, source of funds as opposed to a, a one-off, um, you know, a one-off uh, injection. We'll take that too, but we really need a long-term sustainable new source of funding. Okay. And this is, this question is about just your headcount and your um, staffing reductions that was mentioned. What is the total budgeted headcount in 2018, and what is the breakdown of the frontline and administrative staff in relationship to the, the actual line with the resources and staffing for NYCHA? Wait, are these figures that you mentioned in your testimony in line with the resources and staffing that NYCHA estimates is needed for 2018 with the headcount? Because I know you mentioned an overall from the beginning of, of when you started to decline, or mm -hmm. when you started to... Mm -hmm. um, uh, Attract. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, can you just speak a little more sure. to that particular headcount? I'll speak high level and then I'll ask my EVP for administration to join us at the table, um, Carrie Ju, to speak specific to your headcount question. Um, so. At its height, NYCHA was approximately 16,000 employees. We are currently about 10,600 uh, employees. We budget for the resources that we have. And so um, uh, broadly, we are in one of our expressed objectives as part of Next Generation NYCHA was to um, begin to uh, uh, reduce the number of central office uh, staff Mm -hmm. while reallocating those resources to the front line. So that was an expressed goal as part of our plan, and I'll, I'll ask Carrie to speak specifically to your to the specific numbers. Thank you. Hi, Carrie Jew. Uh, Carrie Jew, Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer. So our um, current 2018 budgeted headcount is 10,684. And that is approximately 5,400 in frontline and 5,200 in central office. Okay. And you do have consultants on staff, correct? Um, and if you and when I say consultants, I mean actual employees of NYCHA, but they're consultants who have been hired and they work in the NYCHA offices. And if you can speak to how many of the consultants are employees, or did you consider them in the number that you just read so, off? Thank you for your question. Um, I think it's one of the largest areas where we are using consultants is in our Sandy program. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna ask our, our my EVP for capital projects who oversees our Sandy Recovery and Resiliency program where we've made a considered choice because of the short-term nature of those funds to, uh, to uh, use a construction management approach to manage and, and, and execute on that program. 
And if you can just explain like, exactly who they are and the number. Okay, Deborah Goddard, Executive Vice President for Capital. In our Sandy program, we have a firm called Aptum who provides our program management uh, staffing, and I have to get back to you on the number. I only have four NYCHA employees in the Office of Recovery and Resilience, and the rest is being done by consultants <coughs> due to the limited um, period in which we will be spending money. Um, but we've also discussed with you that there are some consultants in our CPD, uh, Capital Projects Division as well. Again, um, we have some short-term money and we need to uh, bring people in to get the money moving or we sometimes use it as um, to cover while we're hiring. And we have 18 uh, of those in capital projects, um, some of whom are filling in vacancies that we're trying to fill and others of whom are here to move some of the projects that have short-term money. Okay, and the job titles for those individuals? We can, we can follow up with the... The reason why I'm asking this line of question is because I had a meeting with one of the unions, and one of the complaints was the fact that um, NYCHA hired some 200-plus um, consultants for um, particular jobs, and this was the um, architects and engineers, right. mm -hmm. and stated that those particular positions can be um, actual union uh, members, and the cost would be much lower mm -hmm. than what NYCHA is actually paying the consultants. So I was just trying to figure out mm -hmm. exactly what that um, I'm um, not sure level of employment was at NYCHA, and if there could be some cost savings. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that number 200 comes from, so. It, I don't know where that comes from. I know that I have 18 consultants on staff at the capital projects aside from Sandy. And again, Sandy is time limited work. Um, I've, um, and, and with respect to cost, um, for the most part, our consultants cost less on an hourly basis than staff. Okay, thank you. So I'll now open it up for questions from my co-chair, Councilmember Gibson. Thank you so much to our chair. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman, for your testimony to you and your staff, the executive team. Um, certainly for all of the work that has been done during your tenure, really want to um, just say that we appreciate all of the work that has been done to really reform the system at NYCHA to make sure that residents are given the services that they rightfully deserve. Um, <clears throat> in my new capacity as chair of the subcommittee on, on capital, um, it's been a priority for me to understand the entire capital budget process and what NYCHA has in its toolbox in terms of resources, the measures like design build, and how we can help expedite some of these capital projects. Because generally speaking, when we stand with the mayor and others and we make these broad citywide announcements of millions and billions of dollars in capital work, um, many New Yorkers don't understand all of the internal mechanisms that have to happen in order for that money to trickle down to a development. So I want in this level of conversation to understand some of those specific details because if we are going to continue to be a partner and if we are going to talk uh, in favor of a program like Design Build, we have to be confident that NYCHA has the ability to use design build, right? And, and so I, I wanna make sure that the resources we're talking about are sufficient to meet the level of work that is necessary um, when you talk about capital. So my first question, um, and obviously the federal disaster that we have to live with, we really acknowledge and, and recognize that those federal potential cuts are harsh, um, but that doesn't negate the housing authority from managing the money that it gets today from the state and the city better and improving efficiency. So number one, I first wanna understand within the capital budget process, how does it work from design to construction in terms of the capital division? Who does the designing of these projects without a design build? What does the architect team look like when we get to the actual designing and the relationship that NYCHA has with OMB to actually get 
the certificate to proceed on projects. Can you please help my colleagues and I understand what that process looks like? So thank you for your question and, and for your support, um, Madam Chair, on, on, you know, on a number of projects in your, in your district and, and beyond. Uh, I'm really happy to hear you talk about um, the capital process because I think we are, NYCHA is unique in that we actually have three federal capital, pro three capital programs that we are administering. Mm -hmm. And as in my testimony, I talked about the fact that under our administration, first, our federal capital program, which is our largest and represents right. the largest percentage of our, our, our capital program, we have um, obligated money faster, we have spent money faster, we've okay. delivered projects on time and under budget. On the city money, city capital dollars that we have received um, as it relates to uh, particularly the safety and security enhancements, um, mm -hmm. a commitment that we made at the outset of this administration is that we would um, spend those dollars in the, uh, the fiscal year, the, the, the following fiscal year that we received, the calendar year that we received it. That has mm -hmm. happened for three years in a row, um, and we've continued to deliver uh, those projects on time. Um, I, I can't speak to the state money because that money did not come to NYCHA. I think, as you know, uh, the $100 million was administered by the dormitory authority, not NYCHA. Um, and so their pace of how they've spent that money, I, I would defer to them. Um, and then so now specifically in terms of how it works when we receive mo city money, mm -hmm. which is different from the other pots that I've talked about. I'll turn it over to, to Deborah. Okay, Lattery. no, no, thank you for specifying. That's important. Um, so yes, I'm talking specifically about city sure. capital money that we get that has to be approved by OMB. So we use a combination of in-house architects and out-of-house out out architects on smaller projects, um, particularly landscapes and playgrounds. It's more cost-effective to do it in-house because the, the projects are so small and so therefore the, the design fee is, is quite small. So it could be either out-of-house or in-house. Um, we have a team in-house that's working with whatever the design team is. We have an estimating group, so at Several times along the way of design, we are doing an estimating check in terms of what scope is and what the budget is. I will say that on our smaller city projects, this is where there's often some delay as the scope and the budget do not match. And we work with uh, the, the sponsoring council member to repurpose funds or reduce scope or, or get additional funding in the coming year. Um, so that's something that's a little bit different for our smaller city projects. Uh, once we are ready with, um, uh, I will also say, to contract with uh, issue task orders for either design or construction, we do have to go through OMB. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty smooth relationship there. We also need to go through the comptroller's office. Um, we think those two processes probably range from anywhere to uh, three to, uh, no, yeah, I'd say three to four months. Maybe they go a little bit longer when you combine the two of them. Um, we publicly bid the construction. We may have existing capacity in contracts. Again, we try and be quite efficient so that there are times where we bid design or construction contracts. It's what we call indefinite quantity, and we're able to do a task order. We've, we've gotten an award for a, a, a contract that's up to. We have a project come in. We do a task order, so it's an efficient way of doing it. Um, construction, again, publicly bid. Um, we have to vet all of our contractors, whether they're designers, out of house, or contractors and their subcontractors through the Department of Investigation and Office of Inspector General for clearance. We go to the board for awards over a million dollars, I believe. I'd have to check that. I think it's over a million. Um, issue of letter of award and then you're going to see a period of time um, where the contractor is getting their permits filed, they start mobilizing, um, getting stuff out ready in the field and then they will hit construction. Depending upon the nature of the con construction, we may need sign-offs at the end from FDNY, we always DOB, maybe DEP. I should also, there's a DOB, obviously a DOB plan review process uh, earlier as well. Okay, so the process you just described, 
on average, and I know it depends on the project size, so renovating a playground is much different than replacing a roof. Right. Um, so that design process is obviously a, a variation. But the typical time frame, and we've expedited with city money, so I understand one fiscal year, but in all that you described, what does the staff look like? Like, what is the entire team that actually works on all of this from design to the budget, the scope, registering the contract, the bidding, and then construction? Uh, to give you a precise answer, I'd have to take some time to think it through, but I could speak generally a little bit about what a team might look like. So at CPD, it would involve an architect or an engineer in or out of house. It would involve, at various points, an estimator. It would have a project manager, an assistant project manager, and then when it's um, in the field, it would have an inspector. And are all of these staff NYCHA staff or outside The project consultants? management staff are, are all in-house. We do have, as I mentioned, we do have, a, I think, three consultants on board filling positions that I'm trying to fill as permanent positions. Okay, so we have vacancies in this unit? Yes. Okay, when do we expect to fill the vacancies? It's an ongoing process. Um, it is difficult in this market. The, the, the construction market is very strong and we cannot compete with salaries. So it's, it's just an ongoing process, of doing outreach, taking in resumes and uh, interviewing. Has that been shared with OMB in terms of the challenge of hiring staff? I don't know that I've explicitly share, shared that with OMB. I think it's relatively well known that it's a challenge. Um, okay. So does this also apply in, in terms of the, the general time frame and schedule that you just described? Does this also apply with the mayor's announcements on boiler work and roof work? Because that is, as I understand, all city dollars, so it would fall under this same process. Yes, and as we mentioned, um, with the challenge that was issued around heating, we did step back to take a look at how we're doing things, and we are cutting um, our design work into six months from 12 months. All of that design will be done out of house with um, engineering firms. We've also um, are going to the board later this month to request authority uh, that I could sign construction contracts and then ratify at the board so we could move it without waiting for the board schedule. Um, as well as we have commitment from DEP to shorten one of their review periods. We're meeting with DOB tomorrow and we met with OMB earlier, yes, earlier this week. So we are um, very fortunate in getting what I've been calling fast lane commitments from our sister agencies to help with our heating program. Okay, so with the heating program and the replacements of boilers, are we using outside folks as well as internal or just exterior, just outside? Outside for the design, um, project management will be, um, we will be having a program manager um, because we will not have additional staff and it's time limited money. So we will be using a combination of outside and in-house staff. Okay, the reason why I ask is because most New Yorkers don't understand that, you know, replacing boilers means building an actual brand new boiler. It's not going to Home Depot and purchasing a boiler, as, as easy as that sounds, we wish we could, but boilers have to be built out. And the typical time frame I have of construction of a boiler can be anywhere from two to three and a half years. So that's a long time. So what we're trying to understand with an authorization like design build, I think it's safe to say that we expect, if we get design build authorization, that most of that work will not be done by the housing authority. Is that safe to say? We will be hiring design build teams. Yes, the design will be out of house as part of a team Okay. With the construction. With construction? Yep. Okay. And that's where you're going to save your time, your design and your construction overlap for the most part. Um, and you start putting out the early parts of your construction as design moves along. Okay. And the reason I ask is because I just want to make sure that these projects need to be expedited yep. because the residents are living in dire conditions and we don't have time for design and construction and design build has the ability to expedite that yes. but only if we have the ability to use it 
properly. Yes. I cannot emphasize that enough. Design build will not help if we don't know what to do with it. Correct. So it's important, you know, as we have these conversations, if we are supporting design build authorization, we just want to make sure that NYCHA has systems in place to use it in an effective way. To that point, um, yesterday I met with staff and uh, I've asked our law department to give me a scope um, to bring in outside counsel to help us with forms of contracts because we've not drafted these before, as well as um, we are going to also bring in a program manager with his design build experience to augment what we're doing in-house. Okay. The certificates to proceed that are approved by OMB, I've been told that the typical time frame could be anywhere from 30 days to 45 days on average. Do you receive blanket certificates to proceed or are they very project specific? And are you finding that within this structure, that is a challenging part to get approval from OMB to proceed? Um, I think we've, we've smoothed some things out with OMB. We have, we have a very good process there. And the, your, the answer to your question depends. If it's something like Local Law 11, that's very specific. Every project has to be looked at to determine capital eligibility versus expense. On our CCTV, we came to a written agreement. This is what's capitally eligible, this is what's expense, and I've certified that I won't send anything to them that mixes those up, and so they don't, look, they don't need to look at it um, case by case. So we're working through, we've been working through those issues over the last 18 months. Okay, so they have been progressive conversations. Absolutely. Okay, okay. We just want to be supportive if we can. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Chairwoman, you spoke about recent allocations from the state, and while I know that the state allocated $100 million to fiscal years ago, uh, that money went to DASNY, and DASNY was doing the work. The conversations with NYCHA on the work that was done, the work that remains to be done, where are we with that? Is there a percentage of completed projects you can share? Actually, I'll turn it back over to Deborah to give you a, a very specific piece, but to say that um, you are correct that that work was, uh, we worked very closely with our colleagues at DASNY um, once it was clear that they were going to be the ones executing that program. We had a dedicated group of people at the within Capitol to um, play that interface as they were new to NYCHA and understanding the, the sort of specifications of what construction meant at our buildings. Um, and then the, the most recent um, uh, update in terms of where we are on that, where they are on that $100 million. Deborah, if you could. Okay. I am shuffling through my data here. Um, I do know that as of um, the end of February, they had spent approximately $31 million of the $100 million. Um, and I can get a project count, but I just need a few minutes to. That's fine. Um, I mean, we're not even halfway there. So I guess that's the frustrating part about it. Our state colleagues were, you know, using this money on major work, intercom, door repair, replacements, et cetera. And we're only at 31 million out of 100 million. So we have more work to do. Yes. Um, the $100 million that was allocated by the District Attorney of Manhattan that focused on security enhancements at the neighborhood map developments, the 15, I represent one, Butler, um, and others. So was that money draw, drawn down on? Yes. On the uh, map, we are um, on schedule to complete. Um, there are, I believe, um, uh, Five of the 14 sites are, of the most recent money are completed um, and we're on schedule. I can check Butler for you if you want me to. When do you expect to complete all sites? Just a minute. Okay. And the reason I'm asking all these questions is because, again, this is a lot of money. And when residents hear about these announcements, they expect work to be done. So the 15 neighborhood map developments were the 15 we targeted that had the highest concentrations of violence. We invested millions of dollars programming, um, summer youth, we did a lot. And with this 100 million from Cy Vance, uh, those security measures are going to be very beneficial. I will tell you that Butler is done, and I um, am having trouble reading my own information here. Okay. I also wanted to ask why you're looking. Um, Madam Chair, you talked about the $200 million from last year's state budget mm -hmm. that has yet to be allocated. Correct. Reason being? 
I can't speak to that. I, what I can say is that we have worked very closely uh, with um, our colleagues, both um, uh, in the elected officials as well as uh, the, the budget office to provide a plan. Um, I personally uh, began meeting with um, our statewide colleagues uh, early in 2017 to talk about uh, the components of what, how we thought money should be, what money should be spent on. So there is, an, and they've had a very detailed plan as to how that $200 million would be spent. We proposed $100 million for elevators and $100 million uh, for um, boilers, I'm sorry. Um, and so we, again, welcome their uh, uh, support to, to release those funds and, and execute on that plan. I think that the assembly's uh, uh, plan or bill that, that's been passed um, reaffirms uh, the commitment for not only allocating what was already put, put forth, but committing new resources to deliver on these really important capital projects. Okay, well I appreciate the answer. I just think it's insufficient. Um, we can't talk about new allocations of money if we haven't even been given the 200 million that was put in last year's state budget. So something is wrong and I do know, you know, there is a level of trust that is lacking here. The state does not believe and have the confidence in NYCHA's ability to draw down and spend this money and that is concerning. So if we're asking for new money, I want the $200 million that the state allocated in last year's budget first and then I want new money. So, you know, I think, you know, those conversations we have to expedite and figure out how and, you know, the best way and the best approach to work together unless the new money is, is the same $200 million that we weren't given. I mean, that's just not good. So, you know, again, I, I think it's really important that facts help shape the narrative here, which is we have spent federal dollars ahead of schedule. We have obligated those dollars ahead of schedule. We have spent and obligated city dollars that we committed to at the beginning of this administration. So, you know, and we have put forward a very detailed plan with all of the necessary checks in, in addition to the existing uh, oversight that the state has. And so, you know, we have, we've come in partnership and we very much would like to move on the $200 million that has been allocated. I couldn't agree with you more. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm gonna move on and I think in light of the federal proposed cuts, you know, the money that state and city gives cannot replace federal dollars, but the state and city should certainly attempt to do better. Um, before I turn it over to my chair again and we get to other colleagues, I did wanna ask about this commitment rate of 22%. The commitment rate for those that may not understand is the percentage of funds that are actually spent on capital and the actual contract being registered by the controller's office and the work actually beginning. And so that rate for NYCHA consistently has averaged around 30%. So we're nowhere near the citywide average of 57% in terms of our commitment rate. So I wanted to understand the challenges and why we are so low and what we are doing as a housing authority to improve that commitment rate and actually get these contracts registered so that the work can begin. First again, I just, I think it's city capital dollars. Yes, okay, Okay. I'm sorry, Yes. Let's, let me clarify, city capital dollars. Thank you. Yes. I just saw that report this morning and I, I do want to dig into it, um, Madam Chairman. I, I do think there are a couple things going on here. Uh, number one, we deliver, uh, we also deliver our federal pipeline. So we're not just a single stream of funding and we've got a lot of work going on. Number two, um, this mixes together roofing, local law 11, our layered access, as well as the um, smaller city cap projects. And I, as we've said, we're already on time or ahead on roofs, on time or ahead on the security projects. So I think what we need to look at are the smaller projects, which as I've mentioned, have problems often between scope and budget. Um, but I need to dig into that number. I saw it for the first time today. Okay, it's about $371 million, but we can talk further about it. Okay, okay let's get to all the colleagues and I'm gonna turn this back over to our chair, uh, Alika Amprey Samuel, thank you. We have been joined by our Majority Leader, Council Member Cumbo, and we've been, jo been joined by Council Member Joe Nye. 
So the first question is from Council Member Radinchik. Thank you, Madam Chairs. And you have five minutes. Five minutes, okay, I'll try. Um, I wanna get to follow up on uh, what Chair Gibson talked about, the capital commitment rate. We heard this morning from DEP, um, their rate is at least three times what your rate is. And in many ways, the work that they do is much more sophisticated than the work that NYCHA does. They're building tunnels, they're building sewage treatment plants, all these kind of things. And yet they, they, have, they have to deal with the same city of New York, but they seem to get their capital commitments out in front way beyond what your capital commitment rate is. And I don't understand the difference. I just don't get it. And the answer I heard that you have a lot of different things going on, I'm sure you do. There's over 2,400 buildings in NYCHA, but it doesn't explain to my sensibility why this rate is so low. And I'd like to know why, because you're asking us for more money. People come to us all the time. We, we want to help the residents of NYCHA. They had a brutal winter. We don't want to see that repeated. You're going to hear from my other colleagues here. You're going to hear from Mr. Traeger about resiliency and, and what hasn't happened there. And I don't have the confidence, I want to have the confidence, but I don't have the confidence in suggesting to my colleagues and my speaker that we put up more money with a 22% commitment rate. I just can't. Um, so again, let me uh, restate that I do have to look, look at the number. Um, I'm a little bit surprised at it myself. Um, my, but as I said, we are also moving HUD money. We're moving that well but ahead of schedule. We're moving our roof money ahead or on schedule, our security money ahead or on schedule. So I need to dig into this. I, I would appreciate getting an answer from anybody on this because I'm really not getting an answer right now, which begs the question that uh, I'm gonna ask, and you may not like the question, but maybe it's time that NYCHA subcontract out the capital construction project to somebody else. You know, I go to my senior centers, I have five excellent senior centers, none of them are run by DIFTA. DIFTA gives them money and somebody else runs them. They do a wonderful job. I'm happy with all my contractors, Catholic Charities, Samuel Field Y, JASA, so on and so forth. Is it time for somebody else to be doing the capital construction under your, under your watchful eye? Is it time for NYCHA to give up the capital construction program? So thank you for your question. You know, as we said, we are managing three different programs and, and we, we've actually, um, asked the same question as it relates to some of these smaller legacy programs and projects that I believe contribute to that number and I'd like to see that the report that you're referencing. Um, and so we actually have, have raised this issue with our colleagues at DDC in particular. At where? I'm sorry. At DDC, okay. the Department for Design and Construction, particularly around smaller projects like playgrounds, like community centers, um, which we know are in critical community assets, um, but take, frankly, as much time uh, as, as a large rehab of a building. And so those are conversations that we've had and we will continue to have with them because we do, you know, we believe our resources should be really focused on what's happening in residents' homes. And if we can partner with our sister agencies on some of these smaller projects, I think um, with your support, we could work to get that number up. All right, I, I, I think maybe it's time to take a, you had suggested we need to look at new streams and maybe it's time to take a, a radical look at how we do this because it's just not happening, at least to my satisfaction, and I'm, I know that feeling uh, is shared by many of my colleagues. Um, I thank you for your answers, and with that, Madam Chair, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Reverend Diaz. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Chairwoman Olatoy, uh, Yesterday, Governor Cuomo came to the Bronx to forest houses Jackson. To, to the Bronx, to, to one of the development in the Bronx. I think it's Rafael Salamanca district. And he showed, I mean the press and the news show an apartment dilapidated and the paint falling down, the cockroaches 
running all around. It was, it was, it was, it was I think, that one of the worst things that you could see. And in that building, there is a, a, a 14 years old baby, sick, and with asthma, and that, that shouldn't be there. After seeing that, after seeing that, uh, no gesture by, go by Governor Cuomo. Two questions I want to ask you. One, did your staff advise you that there's a, ch a child, it's a 14 year old child there that needs to be moved and to be protected? And suggest this, anything has been done? And the other one is, do you think that Governor Cuomo was trying to show you how to do work, how to do things, or, he, or does he have an ulterior motive? So, um, Governor Cuomo is welcome to come to the Housing Authority anytime, and he visited Jackson Houses in the Bronx, and, um, you know, I think instead of focusing on press conferences, you know, the, the, the key thing here is those conditions are unacceptable, and um, we were not in com communication with the office in terms of that particular family and their issues, so no one advised me about this for no, young that, person. That, that, that is a job of you staff and people to go no, no, and no. check. No, I mean, but and the, 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 everybody, but everyone, any, everybody saw that apartment and that the condition. I, I, I'm agreeing with you, sir. Uh, I'm agreeing with you. Okay. So, so I think the first thing is con the conditions are unacceptable. And then your second question was, um, what has transpired since we were made aware of this visit and and the conditions in the in the in the unit? And I will. Wait, uh, you, you, you want I, the I just, answer? I just, I just want. I'm just hmm. trying to prevent uh, for you, associate and you department to to have to be criticized one week from now before doing something to fix that apartment. Because if, there's press, if the press and the, and the governor show you that apartment, the condition and the kid and the children that, that are getting sick there, it's for you to move and you start to move, do something in that apartment before next week somebody goes there and says nothing has been done. So if I could just give you an update on where, where we are with that, with that particular. Right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vito Mostachulo. I'm the acting general manager um, at NYCHA. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, so we took a very close look at the history of the complaints and the repairs in that unit, and we're still evaluating um, the conditions. Uh, we did have a team go out there immediately after learning of the conditions. As the chair indicated, we find what we, the conditions unacceptable. Okay. Um, I believe work has been completed in that particular apartment, but more importantly, um, what we're looking at is the entire process. Um, so we need uh, to understand better. Um, I don't have too much time, and I don't want you to take all my time explaining, okay, you know, sir, what you have done, haven't done. As soon as we I don't want you to take my time explaining how bad how you make the chairman look all this time, because you're supposed to be the one doing so she could look good, and you are making all her look bad. But sir, I started two weeks another, ago. Another question I have, I'm gonna, another question I'm going to have, and I'm going to uh, see that she's not looking bad discriminating against tenants in NYCHA. But also, now I find out that she, that they also, look, it's you, you department, you people, the department making you look bad and discriminating against your employee. I have this lady here, has been an employee from NYCHA. She is a Cuban refugee, authorized with all the document to work in NYCHA for 20 years. She's ready to retire to get her pension and now because her, her document has been, her renewed document has been laid, uh, holding, uh, has been early in, in Washington, she got fired. A woman, a refugee, mm -hmm. we, working with NYCHA for 20 years, and she got fired. And then you said that you're protecting women mm -hmm. and immigrants and all those things. Come on. Come on, so, you gotta do better than that. Sir, this is the first that I am hearing of this situation. If you can provide me with that That's information. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. This is this this was signed by Nico Van Jen, interim director of human resources, resources department. You're making her look bad. All you people, fire, fire all of them. So they could make you look good. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And would you please? And by the way, by the way, let me give you let me give you the ID would you, number of the lady. It, maybe not an open counsel. Her name her name is Maria Fernandez, ID five four okay. two no, 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 three. No, 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 no. So, Councilman, we would be happy to take that information okay. right now. Sorry. Someone, Carrie, can you just go and grab that from him, and okay. and actually and try and get a response to try and find out what the issue is. I wouldn't. I don't want to share her personal information in open setting, but thank you for bringing it to our attention. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Council Member Richards. Thank you, Chairs, and thank you, Shola, and I certainly don't envy anyone who has a sit in your uh, particular seat because there are just so many underlying issues uh, at NYCHA. Um, first, I wanted to start off yes. with um, management structure, and I guess along the lines of, I know Vito is here now, and I know we brought this up before, does NYCHA do any annual inspections at apartments? Um, so I guess that's my first question. Do we do annual inspections? Because it seems to me that instead of us taking more proactive steps, which is difficult, I understand you only have a certain amount of work workforce, um, but have we thought about annual inspections that could catch a lot of the underlying issues rather than people having to call 707. And I think one of the things that is the, the, the NYCHA's challenge with is, is the trust factor, right? And I think there are a lot of residents who call 707 perhaps just have given up hope and faith in calling the number at all. So that's why you would see an underlying condition like we saw yesterday on the news. Um, so just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Um, and then I have two other questions and sure. then I'm done. And Vito, I know we spoke about this at the last hearing, how we rethought and reimagined what that process looks like at 707, with the 707 number. So first I want to um, thank you very much for your continued support. Um, so we, and, and just in my first two weeks, um, we are starting to look at the business practices and, and the logic that goes into how we conduct business. Um, and there are improvements that need to be made. There is no question about that. Um, as the chair's testimony indicated, a lot of strides have been made uh, to improve the overall living conditions, um, but we're continuing along that line. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the executive vice president for operations to speak with respect to annual inspections. There are some that are required by law. Um, there are others that perhaps, and I am a proponent of proactive uh, mm -hmm. measures. Cool. Um, and it, so it is something that we will be looking into. Yeah. And I don't want to stay too long on this, but I'm, if it hasn't been thought about, yes, I, I no. would just hope that we can do a top to bottom down inspection process for every unit in the city, perhaps, so we can know where a lot of these underlying issues are. I know it would take a big army to get it done, but something we should consider doing. Hi, Kathy Pennington, um, EVP for uh, operations. I'll give a short answer. Um, yes, we are. Uh, conducting annual inspections. Our goal this year is to schedule half of the units for inspection and the remaining half next year. So we're currently on a biannual inspection cycle and we will be sending out scheduling notices for this year's annual inspections uh, in approximately the next 30 days. And in the other inspection, they look for all these underlying yes. conditions, mold, yes. bugs, all, all the others. Okay. So yeah. I, and, and how do you report that is there a report that is generated to the council or to council members and their districts to know that, you know, the inspections actually happen? And if not, would NYCHA be open to that? Certainly. Okay. So I think that that's moving forward. Lastly, um, just two other uh, quick points. Um, so I know NYCHA doesn't necessarily have commercial overlays, right, in all of the developments. Have we given thought, and I, I want to move past where we're at, mm. we need to look at how to generate dollars. Have we worked with city planning on figuring ways to creatively get commercial overlays in developments which perhaps could produce jobs for local residents and um, obviously some revenue for NYCHA, um, which I know could be controversial, but I think it's something we need to look at. And then lastly, in terms of more revenue coming in, um, we spoke of RAD and the Rockaways, and I'm very grateful I hope the press covers that because that is such a great story of residents who had the most open tickets probably in the city, at least in Queens, who now are getting new kitchens and new bathrooms. And I have family who lives there, so they're not complaining, so I know it's working. Um, so, so 
where are we at with RAD, where are we at with the feds, has the mayor pushed on this, where's our U.S. senators on this, where are our con congressional figures right. on pushing HUD for more RAD conversions. I don't see us getting out of this hole anytime soon. I don't care who you put here, I don't care what the next mayor does, the, we, we just have too much of a backlog. The only way to catch up with is with new ideas. So, so where are we at with RAD? Thank you for your question. Um, questions. Um, first, I'd say um, you asked about commercial overlays. That's where you started, which is to say that has been something that we have, um, where we are doing development. We and and there is a need for that. We have sought and worked very closely and very well with our colleagues at City Planning. Broadly, in terms of RAD, this president's budget, um, a, a bright light, if you could say, is that um, the cap on RAD was lifted. Okay. There had been a congressionally Im imposed cap of, of uh, approximately, I think, 135,000 units nationally. That, that number went up. Um, maybe that number is up, but we'll come back and correct it. Um, that has been lifted. Um, Significantly no, or? Yes. There, okay. There's no more cap, but okay. the challenge there is there's no corresponding revenue okay. to uh, to support new RAD conversions. Mm. So just to now speak about where we are with RAD in our portfolio, our EVP for real estate to Keisha Whites. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. I really appreciate the question. Um, as the chair stated, I'm Takesha Whites. So we currently have approved three bundles with the, just uh, in January, three RAD bundles for over 1,700 units of RAD conversion that we're looking to get um, closed by the end of this year. And we're working with HUD currently to expand that to include approximately 3,100, which would take us to you know, significantly more, and looking to do uh, more, than, more than that at the current time. And just to add a little bit more to the question about uh, the zoning, we are currently um, in the real estate group working with city planning on a number of um, zoning overlays that w uh, impact a number of our developments on rezoning um, and contextually looking at all of that. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thanks. All right. Do you have anything else to add? Go ahead. We we're just gonna talk quickly about the, the East, um, East Harlem rezoning is one of them in particular. Okay, and I'm sure uh, Mark Traeger touch on the Sandy recovery developments. I'm interested in knowing where we're at with all of the developments in the Rockaways and how soon we can anticipate that work, but I'll save my time, I'll pass my time. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much, uh, Chairs Gibson, Nampre Samuels. Uh, I'm Chair Alatwe, it's always wonderful to see you. I appreciate your public service. Thank you, thank you. Um, my first question uh, is about a development in my building, in my district, where I, I just want to confirm that I'm thinking about this right. And this is a development that actually one of your um, board members lives in. Uh, wasn't it the case, this is Wise Towers, right? Wasn't it the case that uh, Wise was initially part of a group of buildings that were funded split with the state. So they were half, maybe half state and half city for a big long period of time. And am I right in remembering that the state walked away maybe, I'm thinking 12 years ago, and NYCHA has had to take resources from other buildings in order to keep these buildings going as well as any NYCHA building goes. Am I vaguely on the right track there? Yes, you are. You want me to elaborate? Okay, so what you're speaking to is uh, the city and the state constructed some approximately 20,000 public housing units in the late 70s and early 80s, um, probably maybe a little bit earlier, and, um, and, and, and supported those units with operating funding. Um, that funding ended in 1998 for that for that popul for those units, and what it meant was the federal operating dollars that we received from Washington now had to in be encompassing of those 20,000 units. So we were taking our subsidy and spreading it over um, those units. Dur with the era or stimulus bill, uh, and thanks to Senator Schumer, we were able to. Uh, essentially turn on the federal operating subsidy for about 
approximately 11,000, 12,000 of those units, um, which allowed for the first time for those units to get a federal operating doll, uh, a subsidy. That still left about 8,000 or so units that uh, continue to be an operating drain on our, uh, our operating subsidy. Um, with this council's support and, and, and urging, um, we have uh, gotten an agreement with HUD to, as those units turn over and in other ways, to turn on Section 8. Um, we have approximately 4,000 of those units left. Um, and are working to, to secure new resources to essentially remove that operating drag on our, on, our, on our budget. Thank you. And I do just want to point out uh, that Board Member Gonzalez has been a, an amazing advocate in ex educating people about the nature of the issue back to the days when we were on the community board together. Um, and I really thank him for his efforts. But I, I, I want to highlight that this was a commitment that was made, you know, by the state, mm -hmm. that the state walked away from, and that the opportunity still exists for the state to come back and share those responsibilities. Um, that, that's my two cents. Secondly, at the last um, hearing, one of the things that we talked about at the end is um, uh, this notion of uh, there being multiple databases, um, most online, perhaps one that was handwritten. And um, as I heard about it, my interpretation was that if these databases could all be, could all talk to each other and be sort of held together in some better way that it would service everyone on your executive team better by having all that information together. Um, since that time, I've spoken with the guy who's um, the director of the CUNY Graduate School on Research and Public Policy, who has offered to meet with um, NYCHA executives yourselves if you would want to take him up on the offer of working to do that. Um, it's something that, you know, he has a team of people working on all the time. And um, I just am hoping that there could be a collaboration with him. I actually was just texting to confirm and he said absolutely yes. Good afternoon, Councilman. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, as I, we had mentioned prior to the hearing, um, please send me his information. Great. Um, we're looking forward to meeting with anyone who has insight, um, who has Great. recommendations. Um, we have already met with um, internally with our um, IT folks okay. to really kind of better coordinate the exchange of information. Uh, NYCHA, as I have found in two weeks, is a, an extremely data-rich um, agency. Um, and there are certain issues that we need to contend with, such as even keeping the heat logs manually, um, as opposed to having that information put into a database, all right? So we are moving forward on that. Okay, Thank great. You. Thank you. And if that's something that requires specific additional funding, um, I, I would be interested, of course, obviously in discussion with my colleagues, but I think that's a discreet thing that could be um, if that could be called out, I, I just think that's the most important tool you have to do your work. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Salamanca, followed by Council Member Menchaca. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, first, I, um, I, I just want to say how happy I am to hear that the RAD program, the cap has been lifted. Uh, one of the developments in my district, Bronx Chester, was a participant, and it has done wonders for that immediate neighborhood. It's right behind, it's right behind Villa Verde, who's half affordable housing, the other half is uh, kind of owner co-ops, mm -hmm. and you really cannot tell the difference. Um, and I see my, my residents coming out of Bronx Chester with pride, it provides a safe environment, they're taking care of, uh, of their property, so I really enjoy visiting them. So I really hope that we can apply and we can get some of my developments um, as part of that program and we can continue to rebuild the South Bronx. Um, 
Now, I, uh, I also, just to get to some of my issues, um, Melrose Houses is a big concern of mine. Um, the boilers, you know, we've mentioned, and I know that they're on the list of the 20 uh, boilers that will be addressed. Uh, where are we in terms of those 20 boilers that will be uh, redone or new boilers coming in, I believe this summer, am I correct? Well, thank you for your question. Um, and glad to hear that you are appreciative of the rat of, of the Bronx Chester work. Just to be totally precise, that program actually predated our use of RAD, um, but but the benefits are the same. And we and we will be working, look forward to working with you to figure out how we can get more resources for the RAD initiative broadly. Um, I'm going to ask Deborah to speak or the to speak to our um, uh, the the interim twenty million dollars I think you're referencing and those short term uh, uh, approaches around the heating systems. Hello, um, Melrose in particular. Um, of the city's money, it's only for heating controls, which we put in about a third of the units, and it gives us the real data. Um, but the uh, boiler replacement um, is will be done out of federal funds um, separately. And I, I have to look. All right, so. I have to get the schedule for you. It, the, this uh, 20 million, is it 10 developments or is it 20 developments? It's 10 developments, 10. right? Mm -hmm. And so has the city, wh what, have you begun that process? You haven't received the money from the city yet, correct? No. Correct. All right, so you're supposed to receive the money in the new fiscal year 19. Yes. Now, have you begun any work in terms of RFPs so that you can cut on some of that time frame so when you receive the money, you can begin the work immediately? Yes, we've already issued the task orders for the design firms, the engineering firms, because we had capacity in federal budgets and LMB will reimburse us, as well as we are uh, working on issuing the program manager RFP. Okay, all right. Um, Madam Chair, you know, um, I know I've, I've spoken, by the way, Vito is great, um, it's, it's awesome, a great pickup from, from NYCHA. We trust Vito, and Vito, you know, just having your presence there, knowing that I'm calling you, and I know that when I call you, things really get done. Um, in terms of Melrose Houses, you know, in the past, Madam Chair, we've spoken about the, what, the mismanagement that's happening in these individual developments. And you, you've, you've, um, you've agreed that um, the supervisors are not really doing, fulfilling their duties in really supervising their employees, so making sure that tickets are not being closed without proper inspection, the cleanliness, um, just proper follow-up. And so my question is, have you done any local leadership changes to uh, kind of move people around, uh, move supervisors around, or developer directors around to uh, kind of address some of these issues that are happening? Because in Melrose Houses, I am asking on the record, please get rid of the supervisors and leadership that I have there because they are totally ignoring their responsibilities. Sir, I'll take that question. Um, so I believe we're scheduled to uh, come up to meet with you. Um, I will make sure that uh, Kathy Pennington, the EVP for operations, uh, joins us. Um, I'd be more than glad to discuss with you some changes that you're proposing. Um, staff are rotated uh, and are moved um, on a regular basis. I think really what you're speaking to, though, um, is something, again, that we want to take a very close look at, um, at the, with the entire process from complaint intake to resolution, right? And we're certainly, there, there's room for us to improve there. Um, with respect to the, the staffing issues, um, that's another challenge that I plan on taking on um, and, and having some very tough conversations with our colleagues in labor. It, Bevito, very quickly, my time is running out. These leadership positions, they're not in, they're not, they're not in a union. Yes, they are. They are in a union? Yes, sir. So these, these, these uh, supervisors are part of the yes, union? Yes, they are. Yes, sir. All right, so we need to have a side conversation. Um, and then finally, just my last question. When a roof, so I got this question from uh, someone that's watching on Twitter. When a roof work is completed, does NYCHA follow up with mold remediation in these developments? So um, oftentimes, if there has been extensive roof damage or deterioration, the top floor units can suffer from water damage. So during the construction period, we are monitoring those units and when 
that repair work is completed on the roofs, we would be doing repairs in those um, individual units. So yes. So but you're only, but you're only checking those top, uh, those uh, units that are on the top floors, um, because you know these roofs they leak. And it's not just the top floors that are being affected, but you have lower floors as well. Yes. Yeah, so if any conditions are reported to us, if a resident calls us to report mold conditions, we do follow a particular protocol to address that, so we would go to the- So floor. when a roof is repaired, you don't check the entire building to see if uh, mold remediation needs to, be, needs to take place? You know what, I'll have to check in with CPD on what the protocol is. I I'm not certain. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Salamanca. I just wanted to just edge in on that a little bit because we, the council members, if we are getting concerns about leadership, property managers, supervisors, and everyone that's at the developments, more than likely the residents are making those same complaints as well. So while I know we will have this conversation offline, it's really, really, really important that we stay on top of these property managers and supervisors. Everyone has a job to do and we expect them to do their job. I don't want average work, I want exceptional work. Everyone has a responsibility and if they're not doing their job, we hold all of you accountable because they work for all of you. And so if we're getting concerns from our residents and our tenant leaders that managers and property managers on site are not fulfilling their responsibilities, then that is cause for a bigger problem. We're not saying we want people fired. I want people to do their job. That's all. And so I want to make sure that as you provide enhanced training and other measures to make sure that people are exceeding expectations, right? It's about what we expect from people. What do they expect from themselves as well in terms of fulfilling their jobs? So if we are hearing concerns, then that means that we're hearing it from the ground. So we need to make sure you guys are on the ground listening to our residents and leaders if they're coming to all of you about these concerns they're having with regard to staff at their developments. Thank you. So I'm gonna just ask a question of, on the same lines. I know you had the Op Mom program that was implemented in 2015 and then the NGO um, program, and I know you mentioned it in your testimony. So can you just speak to um, like just what's happening with the NGO program um, in particular? How the, the, has it been successful? Has it um, reduced any of the work orders and time? So can you just give us an update in a little more detail about the sure. NGO program? So I'll speak high level and then I'll let you get uh, our EVP of operations speak specific to some of the existing uh, work that's underway. So OpMom was, uh, uh, was an effort to, not effort, was our focus to um, empower our property managers, retrain them, essentially retrain everyone who's at the development from the property manager to the caretaker, empower property managers with actual budget, budgeting responsibility that had not been how we had historically managed these properties. That launched in 2015, we renamed it Next Generation Operations. The goal is for all of our portfolio to be like an NGO, to have empowered property managers, to have retrained staff, to um, have greater uh, control over uh, decisions with regard to the grounds maintenance, et cetera. Um, we have about 75, approximately 75,000 units that are part of that effort. Um, with the hope that the remaining of the portfolio is it enters it um, this year. Um, I'll let our EVP of operations speak to some of the performance metrics as it relates to that portfolio to date. Uh, thank you for your question. So to the question of do we think it's working, we do measure performance among our various portfolios in about, I don't have the details in front of you, but in about seven specific indicators. And we have seen in some of the indicators, in about three to four of the indicators, the NGO model is producing better outcomes. Um, we also do see where they're, they're performing the same, right? So for instance, on rent collections, we measure each portfolio on their collection rates. And we see kind of across the board, whether it's NGO or not, we have challenges there. We do see better performance, for instance, in work orders and in, in uh, adhering to our guidelines on emergency um, work orders, they're performing better in those metrics. I can follow up with more specific information. 
Is Melrose part of the NGO program? I'm not sure. I, I, I can find out for you. Okay, thank you. But again, and, uh, the goal here is the entire portfolio, portfolio by the end of the year will be part of NGO. So there's been a, uh, a, a sort of significant retraining of uh, the existing NGO portfolio and almost a boot camp for those uh, developments that have yet to move into to the portfolio. So this is a, a system-wide um, shift towards greater accountability uh, and improved performance across the portfolio. Uh, I would just like a little revision on the timeline. We'll complete um, everyone moving into uh, the uh, new model by June of next year. So right now we're in training and conversion with um, Brooklyn and half of Manhattan, and then we'll finish the Bronx by mid next year. We've been joined, well, we were joined by Council Member Cornegy, and we've been joined by Council Member Williams. Council Member Menchaca. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairs, uh, for this opportunity to talk a little bit more about budget, and thank you uh, for being here. Uh, I want to go right into the conversation around, around mold and legislation that the council, uh, we actually brought the city council hearing to Red Hook when we talked a little bit about legislation that would essentially create a standard across the city to address mold. The response from NYCHA, and this is where I want to give a sense of opportunity for clarifying, was that there is already a process for NYCHA, that the special master um, process and the tenure will end soon and there's going to be a report. Um, there's two questions I want to get to. One is a better understanding of, of the actual issue uh, with, with the piece of legislation that will really grant every New Yorker the opportunity to have every landlord, including NYCHA, the opportunity to respond to mold in a very particular kind of way. Uh, but NYCHA wants to be different. And so I want to understand if this is a resource question or this is a policy, uh, a policy. And that's what I want to understand because we're in a new session and I want, to, I want to go back to the people of Red Hook and beyond and get a sense about how we're going to, how we're going to approach that. If this is a budget issue, we're in a budget, we're in a budget hearing. I want to under understand that. And I'll let you answer. There's a, only a few minutes, but I want to also see if you can give a report on 50-50. There's, uh, there's an RFP that went out and I want to get a better sense about any um, details that came out of the RFP on that, and then, um, well, I'll stop there. Great. Thank uh, you. So I'm not, I have to, I'm not totally clear on your question with regard to the mold bill. I'm not totally up to speed on some of those, de those details. Um, but as you referenced, um, NYCHA is under a federal consent decree as it relates to mold specifically. Um, so we will have a, we have a federal uh, appointed special master who has spent a year or more with us um, to review policies and procedures, training, actual physical infrastructure uh, distinctions that, that, um, that, that plague the authority. Um, we expect his report imminently, and those will be the federally court-monitored requirements that NYCHA will have to be in compliance with. And so from an operational standpoint, um, we, we have sought to, and we are working, to ensure that our staff, our policies, our training um, are consistent with what will be a federal decree. And that is where our resources have to be aligned um, at, at, this, at this moment. Um, shifting to RFP land, uh, you are correct. There, there are many RFPs on the street. As you know, there are four different lanes of development for us. There's our 100% affordable program where there are some uh, approximately 12 RF, uh, RFPs that are out, uh, two of which have actually closed and construction's underway. Uh, seven of those projects are 100% senior projects. In the Next Gen NYCHA program, where there's a 50-50, 50% affordable, 50% market, there are four projects that are sites that have been released. Uh, an RFP was just released several weeks ago for LaGuardia. Um, it's on the street, so we will be in anticipating submissions at some time in the, near fu in, in, in the future. Um, and this is an ongoing and important part of our work in uh, committed to Next Gen, Next Gen NYCHA. Thank you for that, for that update. And back to Mold, I guess thank you for that report on, on the Special Master and the federal decree. 
I, I guess I'm talking about the city decree. And what we're trying to do is really kind of create a standard for every New Yorker, no matter where they live, that there needs to be a response from landlords. What is preventing NYCHA right now from accepting the conversation that we're trying to have here at the city council where we set policy in the city to respond to mold? What is preventing you from saying yes to comply with the discussion so we can set a standard for everyone? That, that's my question. I understand your question, and, and we're not preventing you from having that conversation. I think it's an important one for sure. I do think there is, there is uh, th it is important to note we are a federal agency, and we have to respond to a federal decree with, the, with our federal dollars. At this point, we would, I, I don't know the details of the, the conversation that, and, and the, the details of the bill, and, I, and, and, and so we'd have to learn more to understand what that would mean. Could it be consistent with what we are going to be federally required to, to be in compliance with and where our resources are going to have to be directed? We don't have the luxury of having an extra pot of resources to respond to an unfunded mandate, essentially. So we really do need to ensure that the resources we do have are being focused on what we are going to be legally required to be in compliance with. Got it. Well, I look forward, my time is up, but I look forward to continuing this conversation. Uh, I think the, the goal that I want to set here in this discussion as someone who is supporting that piece of legislation is that every New Yorker deserves uh, the same standard and that we don't create a different standard for one versus the other. And let's talk. Thank you. Thank you. Can you provide the council with a copy of the report when you get it? The special master's report? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay, next we'll hear from Councilwoman Ayala, followed by Councilman Jonai. Good afternoon, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I th my question was around, the. You, I think you mentioned in your testimony um, that a large chunk of, the, of NYCHA's budget goes to utilities. How much of that goes, to, uh, do you have a dollar amount? Fine. Just give me one moment. Um, it's approximately five hundred and thirty-nine million dollars. Million or billion? Million. Oh, million. Okay. A year? Yes. Twenty seventeen. Wow, that's pretty significant. It is. I know that there's been conversation in the past about converting some of these units to um, include. Uh, what do you call those? Uh, the, the circuit breakers, so that meters. so that people uh, meters, yes, individual sorry. meters. Uh -huh. um, has there been further conversation about that? I mean, I'm just asking. I'm not advocating for anything, but I know that um, there has been conversation in the past about that. So um, I'll have to circle back if there have been any more recent conversations. But what we have been focused on is how do we reduce that number? Yes, um, because it is. A, a relatively fixed cost, and it and, and it is pretty variable. If it's a re if if commodity prices are particularly high, then that number is going to be very high for us. If commodity prices are low, then you might see a, sl a slight dip. So what we've been more focused on are ways in which we can make our buildings more energy efficient mm -hmm. and sustainable. And we can talk more about. I don't want to take all your time. We can talk about the ways in which we working to do that through our energy performance contracts by sealing buildings, better windows, um, energy efficient heating systems, et cetera. Um, those have been, and, and, and working with HUD to be able to capture whatever savings is generated by those interventions. So and my second question is around the, uh, around the, the number of commercial properties that NYCHA currently has access to. So you seem from far to be pretty rich in terms of commercial property ownership. I'm not sure how much of those properties are actually on the market, how much of, how much of them, how many of them are just sitting there that you know, maybe require capital dollars for improvements. Um, could, do you have a list of, that you know, explains how many properties exactly we're talking about and what the current uh, status of each is? Sure, well, we, we definitely have a list. Um, and we have, and NYCHA has sort of two types of commercial property. There's what you see on the street, mm -hmm. the sort of uh, the, the ground floor 
a thousand square foot bodega kind of space, um, of which we have about a million square feet throughout our portfolio. Um, and we can get the specific numbers for you and, and, and the, the most recent tenant numbers there, but that has actually been an area where we've focused on increasing the occupancy there um, by, by getting more tenants and with leases, paying rent, et cetera. We also have about another million square feet of non-residential com commercial space, which are closed community and health facilities mm. that have significant capital needs. They are not habitable. Um, and those um, are, are, are a significant opportunity, but yeah. also come with a great cost as well. And so we could uh, follow up with you with a list of those properties. Yeah, I, I think you know we're missing an opportunity to increase revenue by not activating those spaces. Um, my final question, so when I used to work for uh, senior programming uh, many moons ago, uh, see, DIFTA had on their budget item uh, money allocated for rent in NYCHA sites, so we would pay NYCHA to be in uh, Carver houses, for instance. And then under the Bloomberg administration, there was an MOU that kind of reversed that. Has there been further conversation with the administration about possibly including some sort of revenue in DIFTA's budget to cover some sort of rent to NYCHA for having the senior centers, and I guess the same would apply to DYCD for having these uh, the summer youth employment programs on site. Sure, um, thank you for the question. We 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 agree that there that there needs to be at least a, a basic level of covering operating costs, and this has been an ongoing series of conversations that we've had um, not only with our agency partners but with the city. Um, as you know, we at our height we used to run 400 or so community centers, and we're now down to about 14 of which the mayor um, pays for the operations of those centers. Um, but I would welcome your support in continuing those discussions about actual rent for the, the, those other centers that um, are in our facilities. Do you, do you have an idea of how much revenue is lost by not? We can follow up with you okay. with the, that specific number, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Councilman Jonah. Thank you, chairs, uh, for having today's hearings. Madam Chair, thank you for being here again. So good to see you, Vito, Singh. Um, NYCHA currently has a repair backlog that is estimated to be what dollar amount? It's a very interesting question. We have a capital need that um, our 2011 capital plan was about $17 billion in need. And I've heard as high as $25 billion. We are awaiting our final capital need, uh, physical needs report. Has the agency identified any credible way to raise this money? Next Generation NYCHA put forward uh, uh, an effort to reduce that plan to about $10 billion over the next 10 years. Um, and that's been our guide path um, with the hope that we would have built up a series of reserves, um, had a dedicated source of revenue that we would then begin to partner with the private industry and deal and, and actually address um, that outstanding capital need through, the seri through a series of general obligation bonds. That was the plan that we released in 2015. Th that was 10 billion over 10 years, correct? Correct. And what about the shortfall? That was, the, the, the goal would be to then work with the private sector to begin to issue bonds to address that outstanding capital need. So, there is, it's safe to say that there is, you're not relying on Washington or Albany, and besides, aside from the private public option that seems to be a success, in your opinion? Yes. Are the, is the only real options that we have available to bring much needed capital uh, into NYCHA? We need all levels of government. And, and, but there's no question that there will need to be and continue to be a significant level of private investment. Um, but we, we, we need all levels of government and we cannot let Washington walk away from its obligation here. And you, you, you briefly touched on expanding the RAD program uh, to the other developments. Has it proven to be a success and what hurdles do we have to expand this program? It is absolutely a success. There are, there are independent reports done by HUD and others um, to, to suggest that um, it has an economic multiplier so that, that it actually is helping to create jobs and drive local economies. 
Um, but more importantly, and from our perspective, it's improving the lives of residents. In Next Generation NYCHA, we talked about uh, uh, 15,000 units of our portfolio being a part of either RAD or any federal preservation and effort. So far, we have um, approval for close to 5,000 of those units, and we continue to work with HUD for the remainder. As I mentioned, the, the cap has been lifted. There had been a congressionally imposed cap on the program. That's been lifted. That's great. The challenge now is we need other kinds of housing resource, financing resources to close the gap. Our projects are, our, our buildings are very old. They have, a, they have a lot of capital needs. And the requirement of the program is that you underwrite to the 20 year physical needs assessment number. For New York City, that's very high. And it requires that you need a very large, num a very large amount of subsidy. Well, I'm glad to hear that work. And to implement this and expand it to the entire NYCHA system, what, is the, what are the few hurdles that you see need to be overcome? So the, I think the biggest hurdle is, um, one, we, we need new resources. We need new res sort of subsidy resources to support the expansion of that program. Um, two, we do do this in partnership with HUD, so we need HUD to approve. There is an actual process that they go through. Um, we would need them to make that process, expedite that process, and to move that quickly. And they have been very helpful on this front. I do want to give them credit there. There's always more to be done, but they've been helpful there. And then third, um, and I put this as both an obstacle and an opportunity, and we have committed to doing uh, you know, a significant amount of engagement with our, with our residents. And that takes time, and that takes resources. And so you know, we want to expand that to an, our entire portfolio. That's a lot of evening meetings and conversations that we would need to be committed to doing and doing with, in partnership with, with our city colleagues. So I'd list those money, uh, you know, regulatory approvals, and just the sort of public nature of any kind of development activity. I'm glad to hear that you are focused and so it's safe to assume besides exploring public-private partnerships, there really are no other options to get us out of this. I would never say there are no other options and I think everything should be on the table. Um, I commend you on your work and I look forward to uh, working alongside you to meet the needs of these families that are being subjected to all types of living conditions. Um, and I look forward to helping you deliver your message that this will always remain an affordable program, that we have a true commitment to uh, those families, that the income threshold of no more than 30% mm -hmm. is the affordable aspect of this, and we want to make sure that regardless of RAD programs or whatever private-public partnership mm -hmm. that we uh, bring in, that that will always be the underlying fundamentals for continued NYCHA housing. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Traeger, followed by Council Member Williams. Uh, thank you to both chairs for this very uh, timely hearing and, and for your leadership. Um, I, I first want to actually just, uh, uh, you know, publicly say on the record that I, I want to align myself with the comments of uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, who stated that um, Congress is, well, I hope Congress is talking about an infrastructure spending bill and that no infrastructure spending bill should pass without resources to public housing. And I think that is critical. I think that is non-negotiable. And I think that all of us here recognize the significant um, uh, capital needs of, of public housing that existed before your leadership and certainly exists today. So I just wanted to state that for, for the record. And we've, we've heard... Um, that is about 20 or 18 to 20 to 25 billion dollars estimated in capital up net need, is that correct? Correct. Um, has there been ever a kind of a scale of urgency created to kind of break down that figure about, of, of that capital up net need? How much are we talking about roofs, boilers versus playgrounds? Or is there a sort of a scale or degree of emergency capital up net need versus non-emergency items? Sure. Deborah? Yeah, we uh, tackled the needs um, according to building systems and a, and a logical sequence. So roofs and exterior first, 
uh, building systems, heating, uh, life safety, um, uh, elevators next, and then go inside the units, and then grounds. Now, it's not always that easy. You sometimes, you know, mesh some of those kinds of projects together depending upon funding source and need. But we, yes, we are very disciplined about how we're using the money in the best and most logical building, building sequence. So is there, is there an estimate of the emergency need out of the overall capital unmet need? It's not uh, labeled as emergency. We do have, an, and the, the older uh, physical needs assessment is up, up and we can get you more information. We do quantify it by building component, yes. And inside that, um, there are ratings, so every roof is rated, every boiler is rated. Um, so all of that information is taken into account when we do our five-year plan. It will be helpful to get that information sure. for us, uh, for, for our, our advocacy mm -hmm. as, as well. And have you had discussions with um, uh, Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn and the mayor about trying to identify more city resources to, to address some of the more emergency or pressing capital needs. I understand that there's inadequate resources in our city budget to deal with the entire capital unmet, uh, unmet uh, needs, but with regards to the more pressing capital needs, I'm curious to know because I know that in, in an October 2017 release, the administration announced that they identified $150 million in more money to add to their housing plan, which now means that they're spending over $1.3 billion a year over the next decade. So they found resources for that. But I would also argue that we need to take care of our existing housing stock. And so are there discussions underway uh, with the deputy mayor and the mayor about finding more city resources to deal with the most pressing needs of NYCHA? Absolutely. I mean, we are in constant discussion about um, our needs. I have not been silent about the needs that the authority is experiencing. I think that's evidenced by the fact that the mayor committed the billion dollars towards roofs. I walked in and, you know, sort of one, almost day one and said, advised by, you know, my, my colleagues and said, we have to figure out how to seal the buildings and roof. And so that investment, I think, is a direct result of those conversations. Um, we are, you know, talking and, and I know in the weeks to come as the budget process unfolds, they'll be even, we'll get more granular. Um, but yes, issues around continued roofs, um, but, but certainly our heating infrastructure systems, um, our elevators, our health and safety programs, those are all issues that, we, that are absolutely up for discussion. So, and, and I appreciate that, Chair, because, and that's where the information will be helpful for us to know about packaging the emergency needs to, as a point of advocacy with the administration. Sure. Um, because, yeah, you're right, he, they, they seem to find money when there's a lot of attention being paid, paid to these items. And, and I'm not saying that you haven't raised these issues prior to all the attention being given to them, but we need to make sure that we are not just reacting to crisis, but preventing crisis from happening in, in, in the first place. Uh, just ver very quickly, um, have you heard and are you aware that there are quality contractors, quality builders in New York City or, or in our region that don't want to do work with NYCHA because of our financial uh, uncertainties and, and, and issues, and that sometimes we are just stuck with bidders that historically have not had a great track record of doing work in our public housing stock. I have never heard it put that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I am a former teacher. I try to um, articulate things. We, I mean, clearly we add to um, the requirements of normal contracts. We have um, the project labor agreement, so if you're not a signatory, you're not going to bid. Uh, we have resident employment. No insult to that, but it's not nor the normal course. Um, and uh, we have our paperwork is daunting. The HUD requirements we have to add are daunting. I will say to that end, we've been taking a look at all our forms of contract to make sure we've streamlined them as much as possible, that they flow like the world expects. We did bring in uh, for the heating our AE firms um, to let them know what's coming down the pike, and we're doing more outreach. We got a lot of response to that. We brought in CM firms when we were about to go out with a contract. We got 17 new firms to bid. So we're trying to do some outreach um, 
every time we've got a significant pipeline going out. But we have challenges, yes. But I'm sensing from you that you have heard feedback or some criticisms of the procurement process from some builders uh, that discourages them from applying in the first place. Is that correct? Yes. And, and the last question, uh, uh, Chair, and, and I do want to credit your, your team. Uh, every three months or so, we have a breakfast in my district to discuss updates. Your team comes and they answer questions to the best of their abilities. Mm -hmm. So I do want to note that for the, for the record. There is one Sandy Damaged Community Center that was supposed to open at the end of last year, and that's the Surfside Gardens Community Center. Um, and uh, your team informed me that because of leaks in the building or in the leaks in that area, the contractors, the workers, cannot complete work on the center. Um, just to kind of bring context to, to the depth of this problem, it is preventing, because the center is not open, it's preventing HeartShare, a cornerstone program provider, from providing services to children in Coney Island. Mm -hmm. And so they are, they, they, they've been moved temporarily into a public school with very limited space. Mm -hmm. And also, the cornerstone program promises hours up to 11 p.m. at night. Right. But uh, the school closes around 8 or so p.m., shortchanging my kids' mm -hmm. uh, hours every single day. Mm -hmm. Is there any update on when the center will reopen for the children of Coney Island? I don't have an update. Uh, we can get you one. I will say that the, the leak has been problematic, and um, Kathy has been in her position a very short time. Um, but has been very proactive when we bring these issues to her of, you know, the combination of operations and capital. So I expect that we will have some movement on this very shortly. Do you anticipate that it will reopen by the spring? I, I, it would be irresponsible of me to promise I, we will get back to you with a plan and a date. All right. Thank you, chairs, for your time. Council Member <coughs> Williams. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairs. Uh, Chair, uh, just a completely separate topic. Just, topic. just want to make sure I put on the record and shout out the pride I have for all of the students across the nation who uh, stepped out today uh, in Brooklyn, in New York City, and, uh, and across the nation uh, wore orange and making sure that we pressure our cowardly Congress people uh, to move forward on uh, what they need to move forward with. I just do hope, I'm glad to see the Parkland students spark this, but I want to make sure we. Uh, keep the faces of black and brown people, particularly black mothers who deal with uh, gun violence, uh, unfortunately, on a daily basis. Uh, with that said, um, thank you very much for being here. So, you know, obviously, I've seen this, uh, what I can only describe as a, a male measuring contest come to a fever pitch. Um, and it's disturbing. Uh, the only thing that's not disturbing is I think because of the contest, NYCHA residents may accidentally get helped, and I wish it was purposeful. Um, now, obviously, I don't know if, if disingenuous is the best word to use uh, what the governor did, because I think he may actually do something even if it's for the wrong reason, um, because he wants to win what I can only describe as the male measuring contest, and I hope some of that uh, money comes forward. He had seven years to do so. It is the first time he has stepped into NYCHA. Um, and probably wouldn't if it wasn't for this contest. But my hope, again, is that NYCHA will accidentally get helped in all of this. Um, but I do have to just point out, I do think uh, there was things that the governor should have done. There's obviously things that the federal government should have done, uh, and I still will put in particularly, and this is true around management issues, the city does have a lot of culp culpability here. And uh, it was interesting to see, I think I saw a tweet where um, I think, Chair, you said that it's not time for division uh, while we're facing these cuts. Um, I agree. Uh, at times, it seems like there is a division between us, administration, and NYCHA, and hopefully that will be um, sealed up even after when the contest is finished so that we can all um, be working toward the same goals. Uh, I do have just a few questions and that you may have answered again. I uh, answered uh, already. I apologize. I asked you uh, just to repeat it. And uh, I think we are up for capital budget. The needs of NYCHA, is it 24 billion? What's, how much is the, the capital needs? Um, the 24, number, uh, 24 billion number is something I have used in conversations since I arrived 18 months ago just to say it's going to get larger. We are finalizing it now and we will be briefing our board this month and then we will be uh, ready to brief um, the council. How much is, is NYCHA making a request 
to um, the council to push for a certain amount of that budget this year? Is there a long-term plan to ask uh, to try to help fill some of that gap? So we have, um, first, we have absolutely appreciated the support that the council has given to date. Um, and we encourage, um, and I said this at the, at the end of my testimony, um, would request for capital investments for, um, for, for heating, for elevators, uh, and, and other important capital items. Um, we also think it's really important to have your voice on the passage of a, a real and, and long-term design build uh, piece of legislation that would allow us to, to do this work faster. Um, so we absolutely need your support, um, both on the resource side and on the advocacy side. I do want to point, of course, design build 100%. That is obviously one thing the governor can wave his hand and, and just help to happen why he hasn't. He could have brought a check with him and a wave of the hand at the photo op, and he didn't. Um, but, but is there, we obviously can't, it's going to be hard to fill that gap ourselves, but is there a plan to take out bites every single year, and is there a number this year that we're looking for in this budget from the city? We are, as the preliminary budget, we are still um, fashioning those requests. Um, we absolutely have sat with, and, and if we haven't done this with yet, you yet, um, council member, we need to get this on the calendar, have sat with members and talked about specific capital asks for districts. We can afterwards perhaps follow up with that roll up number, but but certainly for districts, we, ha we absolutely have put in requests. Um, and uh, last two questions. How much, uh, I know there's, money that's outstanding from the state that's either just not released or stuck in bureaucracy. I just want to get a better understanding of how much money that is. And then also, uh, Chair Alika Samuels um, may have brought this up already. First of all, I just want to shout out the Chair for her leadership uh, on these uh, NYCHA issues. Thank you for that. Um, um, yesterday, there, did, did you talk about the yesterday? Okay, so um, the speaker agreed to put in uh, the executive budget of $500 million, uh, part of a $2 billion ask from um, ECB and IA Metro, a collective of groups that would like to see 15,000 seniors housing be built on some of the infill in NYCHA. Um, that's going to be put in. Wanted to know if uh, you supported that or the administration supported that. Well, so um, you asked, your first question was about the state dollars. Yes. Um, we, uh, there was $100 million allocated in 2015, of, and that money was given to the, d the dormitory uh, of New York. Um, I believe you said there's about $30 million that's been spent, and we, we would have to talk to them about where the rest of those resources are. How much has everybody spent? $30 million. Thank you. Um, then there was a $200 million allocation um, we submitted a plan to the state. Uh, it's requesting $100 million for elevators, $100 million for um, heating, uh, and with a very detailed plan about how that would be spent, how it would be tracked, et cetera, we await a response. Um, full stop. So now, in terms of your question with regard to the senior housing, um, we absolutely share your and the council's goal on, on uh, addressing the needs of our most vulnerable New Yorkers. And more than a third of our residents are over the age of 62. And that's why um, of the 12 RFPs that we have out on the street right now for 100% affordable projects, seven of them are 100% senior projects. So we agree uh, in, in principle um, and in and, and reality to the need to provide um, more senior housing. Um, not familiar totally with all of the details, but I think one of the, in terms of the, the proposal, um, I, I guess I'm curious, you know, we, one of the challenges with senior housing, I think, as you know, is it requires more resources. Re seniors are typically of fixed and if not lower incomes, so you need Section 8. You need additional municipal housing finance resources. So we just would love to know, w w were there additional resources that were identified as part of the council's proposal? So you've never seen the plan? We have, I, we have spent time with EBC, yes. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if this is the exact same or something is different. I don't. I just. I just haven't seen. All okay. I saw was a release. So I just don't want to speak out of turn. Um, but agree in principle. But would like to know: 
are there new resources that that have been identified? Because we, when in the the plan that I saw, um, was was significant. It would require essentially all of the state's nine percent tax credit allocation. Um, I don't know, you know, how would. My, my understanding was that they felt it could be built with two billion dollars. If I'm if I'm yeah. not correct. I want to go back to the plan, and so sure. we agree, people agreed in, in principle to that $2 billion plan, and the speaker agreed in principle, and I believe did put in the response mm -hmm. uh, $500 million this year to get to that $2 billion goal. So again, I would need to see the details to really understand that, again, we agree in principle that senior housing is important. I, I think it's also really important to note, you know, and these are things that we're trying to balance, which is we need new revenue. We need new revenue to invest in our buildings. Senior housing requires more revenue, and there's a net cost. So can, can both be done? We think we're doing that. We have 12 projects on the street, seven of which are senior housing, and we are trying to build housing that's generating new revenue to fix up our buildings. So we just are tr we're trying to understand how we balance those really important priorities in the face of, of this, this proposal. Thank you. I hope at the end of uh, this contest, the hundreds of thousands of people who are uh, being toyed with uh, actually benefit. Uh, so Great. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're almost at the final hour. I have a question about reserves. The minimum operating reserve recommended by HUD is about two months of operating reserves. As of March 2018, how much does NYCHA have in operating reserves? And how much does Section 8 have in reserves? So presently, we have 2.7 months of reserves. Um, just for clarification, HUD recommendation is four months. OK. And when you started? And to note, as we start, when we started under the leadership of the CHIA, we only had five weeks. So at this point, we have grown it over time. And we're still working towards addressing that, balancing the needs of moving our resources out to our residents versus um, funding the, our reserves to get to that HUD recommendation. recommendation. OK. Thank you. Co Chair. Thank you so much. So I just had a few more questions just to close out today's hearing. Um, and I believe one of my colleagues alluded to it, but in the same conversation that we're having around design build, uh, there's been this talk about an emergency declaration. Um, so I wanted to know what impact, if any, would that have on NYCHA's current capital process and some of your ongoing work that is already in the pipeline? Thank you for that question, because I think it's important for this to be very, very clear and well understood. Uh, an emergency declaration which lists the state's procurement requirements on us would save us, in a, would save us six days for this reason. The state requires 20 days of public advertising. HUD, we're federally regulated, requires 14 days. So it would save us six days. Uh, besides that, would it allow us to waive procurement rules or design or anything else that we're doing? It depends on how it's worded, but it cannot waive um, federal requirements and we're federally regulated. So it won't change the HUD procurement and it won't change any of the HUD um, <coughs> contractual requirements. Okay. Well, I think that's in a, a really important factor to outline because the public thinks that an emergency declaration is going to allow us to bypass every provision, every guideline, and speed up these projects. And, and so you're saying that it doesn't do that because we still have to follow federal rules, even with state dollars that we would get. Um, we are, yes, state dollars for the construction and the design, but HUD is paying for the staff all of the administrative costs, so it is a federally regulated set of projects, yes. Okay. Um, in the NYCHA capital portfolio work, uh, do you work at all with the Department of Design and Construction on design? Does DDC have any involvement at all? No, we do not work with DDC. We are talking with them about taking over some of our community center work, but otherwise we, do, we don't work with them, no. So that's a, an early conversation that just started, or is that ongoing? Uh, it's ongoing. It's been going on for several months. 
Okay. And if that proves successful, that would mean DDC would essentially do the design work. But actually, we're trying to have them assume responsibility for all of our community center capital construction work so that we could focus on our residential buildings. Okay. When do you expect, is there a time frame that you could identify that that would be finalized? I don't, I don't have a time frame. I think there's tension on both sides in terms of capacity. Okay. So I wanted to ask a question about, um, I forget who mentioned it earlier, but the annual inspections that NYCHA does to assess both exterior, uh, not apartment inspections, but just the exterior of your buildings, um, how does that overlap at all with DOB's inspections that cause scaffoldings to be put up on many of our developments, um, not necessarily paralleled with resources to do the work that causes the scaffolding to be put up in the first place. Um, can you give us a, a general understanding? Because I think the general frustration from residents, they see the scaffolding. Um, it is an inhibitor to just safety. Um, the NYPD housing cops complain all the time because all the great cameras we put up, you can't see a thing with the scaffolding. And then you do have instances where there's loitering. It's just a disaster. Um, but if people were to see work being done, I think they would be more accepting and patient with understanding that it's there for a reason. But in the majority of the cases, um, it's just not happening. So can you explain to us how that happens with your annual inspections, and is there a lot of overlap? So we actually do rely on the DOB program, Local Law 11, um, is that, and it is a beast. It's a five-year cycle. All buildings get inspected every five years. So um, it is hard to budget for and predict. We've been working very closely with OMB to be putting out about $100 million a year um, towards Local Law 11, but we do not have funding to get to everything all at once, and it's very hard for us to catch up. We are, on, we are finishing up work on Cycle 7 uh, repairs now, but we're already in the midst of Cycle 8, and again, what's really critical to understand is in 2017, you may find a crack or a lintel having a problem on building A. You take care of it, and then in the next inspection, it's a different wall on the same building or a different building in the same development. So it is a, it is, it's, it's a beast in terms of keeping up with it. Okay, and I think Councilmember Traeger talked about it just in terms of capital and how you prioritize projects on an as-needed emergency basis. So are you doing that as well with, with this as well? We've been um, working with OMB. OMB has been, the city's actually been funding most of our local law 11 work. Okay. Um, and uh, that's 100 million, that's been at the pace of 100 million dollars a year. That's about half of, that's almost half of what we get from the federal government. We have not been putting a lot of our federal money into it. We've been relying on the city money. Okay, and overall, um, I have a graph of the $1.4 billion of capital work, and I have it uh, categorized by project type. So most of the capital work is going to roofs, roof replacement, which I appreciate. Um, and then the next category is heating systems, which is important and a priority. Um, I have not seen any major announcements recently in this administration where we've had a real focus on elevators. Now, while I know the focus has to be exterior, the roof, the heating system, because that essentially is directly related to the quality of life, I would also argue that Elevators are a huge public safety issue. Mm -hmm. And so there is money. I'm not saying that there, you know, there is nothing, but there is money every year that NYCHA devotes to elevators. But in terms of massive infusion, I just haven't seen it. And so I want to understand moving forward what the capital work looks like right now with our elevators. What does the particular unit look like that actually deals with the repairs based on the calls and you know other complaints? 
and future-wise, what can we do to support this? Because again, elevators are important. You have an expectation to get in and get to your floor in a safe manner. And some of us, I'm not you know, calling out any development, but I've had a struggle with one of my developments in particular that has a senior center in the building. And not only are the seniors and the residents getting stuck, but so is the staff. And so I'm working with NYCHA now on how I can do my part in helping with that funding. But overall, I think generally many council members do have that concern about elevators. So when I look at this graph, there's only 3% dedicated to elevators in the total capital plan. So I want to understand where we are, what does our capital look like for elevators, and can we see any expected uh, investments in elevators moving further? Ye yes. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, because Yes, we can see more money? Yeah. We're oh, gonna, okay. We are. Um, the state is 50 percent of that. 100 million is towards elevators. We're turning more of our federal program to elevators. Really, with the mayor taking the roofs off of our backs in terms of federal funding, we're now looking to systems, heating, and elevators. Yes. Okay. So what does the, wh who's the staff that's going to determine the priority? So you're going to look at the entire portfolio of elevators and all of our developments and have some sort of a needs basis on who needs it the most. We can't get to everyone in a time frame, I realize that, but we do have to prioritize. So my question is, what factors are we going to use in determining how we start with the most in need? Yeah. So capital and operations work together and we have generally three things we'd be looking at. One is um, our physical needs assessment and what is determined to be the useful, the remaining useful life of that component. But then we also look at what kind of skill trade tickets or repairs, work tickets have been called to, um, that may change the prioritization. And uh, it may not be so much with elevators, but in general, we'd also look to see um, are all of the parts that are necessary for repair still available? Are they still manufactured? So those would be generally the three factors we would look at to prioritize. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. So I look forward to continuing to have that conversation on elevators. Um, the work that NYCHA is doing with lead, um, I wanted to understand with lead testing the relationship that the Housing Authority has with uh, both DEP as well as with DOHMH. Uh, where are we? Are there any updates that could be provided? And what do we see as the biggest challenges moving forward? So I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure. <clears throat> Lead testing. Respect to, with respect to DEP? Uh, is DEP involved in helping you guys with lead testing? No, they're not. Is it DOHMH? Uh, so DOHMH, um, they are involved when there is a, an elevated blood lead level. Okay. Okay, so that is. Okay, so no DEP. Okay, I take yeah. that back. No, no, it's quite all right. Um, so, um, as you may know, um, this past October, um, we began conducting our visual uh, assessments of both the residential units um, and the uh, residential common areas as required under Local Law 1 of 2004, which is the city lead law. Right, I'm happy to report that um, of the 8,900 units that we were required to, um, to conduct the visual inspection, um, we have completed all of them. Um, there were a few access issues with about a dozen units, um, and we have made multiple attempts both during the week as well as on weekends, um, as well as um, sending correspondence and, and calls to the residents. Um, with respect to the common areas, there were um, approximately 66,000 uh, common mm -hmm. area components that had to be, uh, where we had to conduct the visual inspections, um, and we are about 80% complete with those visual inspections. Um, so that program then brings us into compliance with Local Law 1 requirements. When do you expect to complete? You said you're about 80% done? Right. So we expect to complete those visual assessments by the end of April. Of this year? Yes, this April. Okay. I'm just making sure. That's like a month away. <laughs> just want to make sure. Okay. Um, the, the final question that I have in terms of... Um, NYCHA and the physical needs assessments. Um, the, the building facade work that's being done um, as it relates to the scaffolding, as you take down, well, 
I don't know if NYCHA takes them down, but as the scaffolds come down, um, what happens if there is a subsequent inspection and then it causes the scaffold to go back? So is that NYCHA's responsibility or does that fall to DOB? Um, we, are, we are following DOB's local uh, law 11 inspection protocol, but we are the ones that are putting up the sheds and taking them down. Okay, great. Um, and I guess my final question, um, I've been focusing a lot on capital because it's really important to just understand this, this process. The community centers that NYCHA still operates, um, there was a time when we had 15. Uh, I think we went down to 14. There was a site in Manhattan that went to DIFTA or a private uh, vendor. Are we still having conversations about NYCHA maintaining those community centers for the future? or do you see more work with um, DIFTA? Do you know what I'm talking about, I the see, senior centers? I, I know, oh, okay, because I have I know, two of them. I know exactly oh, okay, what okay. you're talking about. Okay. Um, and uh, I will let our EVP yeah. for Community Engagement and Programs speak to okay. that. Okay, and the reason I ask is because obviously moving forward, yeah. um, some of those centers, I can only speak to the two I have, you know, there are some capital needs in those locations that do need some work. And so what I'm not sure about is if it goes to DIFTA and it goes to a private uh, vendor, uh, a social service organization, you know, are we still responsible for the capital work that needs to be done to bring it up to a, a greater level of quality? So specific, specific to that question, at the end of my testimony, one of the things I think we, we talked about is, you know, we do have capital needs specific to community centers and senior centers. And we would welcome, you know, this body's support in thinking about how we could support resources just for those sites. Um, regardless of who operates them. One of the goals of NextGen had been to eventually transfer the operation of these centers to our colleagues um, who are the experts in both youth programming and or senior programming. We remain, we, we still have them. I'll let, I'll let uh, Sadia talk about them, but very much still need to talk about the capital needs um, okay. that, that we would be responsible for as the landlord. Okay. Thank you for your question. Um, Sadia Sherman, EVP for Community Engagement and Partnerships. Um, so as you referenced, at the time when we transitioned the centers, we had 15 centers. We now operate 14. The Manhattanville mm -hmm. Center transferred to DIFTA. We're in active conversations with DIFTA about these sites, but um, we are still currently operating the, the centers and in conversation to continue the operation into the next city fiscal year. OK. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Councilman Bright. Oh. Just for the record, um, I just want to retract a statement where I said that we will be in full compliance. Um, so once we complete the visual assessments of the apartments, um, once we have um, completed the visual assessments of the apartments and the common areas, we will not be in full compliance and we will be in substantial compliance. There's still some additional work that would need to be done. So we're not saying April then, right? No, no, I'm sorry. We are still on, on target to complete the visual assessments of the 66,000 common areas by April. Mm -hmm. We have completed the residential units. Um, but there still are some additional requirements that we have to complete. Okay, okay. Well, I thank you. There's obviously always a lot more we can talk about, but you know we all have places to go. Um, but I think just generally, overall, um, we're doing good, but we have to do a lot better. Um, I am very, very, very concerned about design build and NYCHA's ability to comply with that, to use it in a way that it can advance these projects. And I do think there's a concern from the state as well. It doesn't mean that we won't support the authorization for design build, but we just wanna make sure that there are systems in place. So when I talked about the staffing, what does the design, the architects, you know, what does that staff look like? Because if there are any changes and shifts and vacancies, that that's going to affect the outcome of our work. And so that's a concern for me. So as the assembly has just passed their one house, because I heard from my assembly member, um, now you know we're going to continue to work in the next few weeks as they craft a state budget. But the $200 million from Albany has to be produced. And you know, there's no shortfall on that. We need that $200 million. It would be great to get more, but we want the 200 million that's already been allocated that you know you haven't been able to draw down on. Um, I want to do as much as I can as an individual council member, and I have been every year putting money into the budget for NYCHA to capital. I mean, I always do because I have a lot of developments that need attention. And in some of the citywide broad 
you know, announcements, my district doesn't always make the cut. Uh, yes, I yell and scream, and sometimes we make another cut, but at the end of the day, I'm still going to do my part. Um, and so I appreciate the work you guys are doing, and we're critical because we know we can do better. And I think acknowledging and recognizing that there are shortfalls, there are challenges we face from the feds, from the state, and even locally, um, but we just have to all be in this partnership together. Um, the fact that you hear some of the nightmare stories, that's how people live every single day. And we have to change that because they deserve better. If we lived in those apartments, we wouldn't accept it either. So we can't accept someone else living in apartments that are substandard. So we do have to do better. Um, I appreciate the work that has been done. All of the staff, the property managers, everyone on the ground do tremendous work. I just think we have to obviously always look at ways of improvement. So in my capacity, I'm going to continue to talk about design build, change orders, certificates to proceed, the work with OMB, because that is the internal work that's going to determine a better output for all of these capital projects that we're undertaking. So I appreciate you being here. I thank you for your work and looking forward to working with you during this budget process. And I want to thank my co-chair for being an amazing co-chair today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, chairs. Thank you, everyone. We look forward to continuing this conversation and continuing to be as supportive of as we possibly can and making sure that this is a partnership, not just between your agency and the council, but with the residents and making sure the residents' voice is heard and we all bring them into the conversation as well. So thank you so much for your testimony and being here and your partnership, and we look forward to talking to you again. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. We appreciate your support and partnership. So next we'll have testimony from members of the public and we'll first hear from, I'm gonna do this one first. Okay, so we'll hear from Ms. Torres, Nancy Ortiz, Mr. Miller, Kadar Miller, and Alex Rodriguez. Hi, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> I know we are in our final hours here. So um, if you don't mind, we would hear from everyone individual, uh, one after the other. Okay, and we'll start with Ms. Torres. Good afternoon. And can you state your name for the record? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Aixa Torres, and I'm the president of the Resident Association of Alfred E. Smith Houses Incorporated. Good afternoon. On behalf of the residents of Alfred E. Smith Houses, I am submitting my testimony. Smith Houses has been complaining to NYCHA for over 20 years about the boiler system and the problems we have with the heating and the consistency of water leaks. The heating system is over 65 years old and probably in violation of several codes. The disinvestment of public housing by HUD 
has taken its toll on the infrastructure of the buildings where we live in. There is a saying that says that the water dripped until it broke the rock. The rock NYCHA has been broken, not because of this administration or their efforts, but due to the lack of disinvestment of infrastructure of NYCHA buildings as a whole for over 20 years. There was no input or investment from the New York State government or the New York City in investing in NYCHA until now from this administration. HUD has, however, allocated $300 million to flattening developments like in Chicago to solve the problem. The total lack of funding, 0% for NYCHA by HUD, as seen in the table below, tells the story of investment by this current government administration. What this means for Alfred E. Smith residents is not having healthy or clean environment because we have roofs or pipes inside the walls that leak and need to be replaced, not repaired or patchwork. While this administration has tried to address the problems in three and a half years, it cannot fix the, negative, the negligence of 20 years, nor can NYCHA correct overnight or in, two and, in three and a half years, especially without funds. In Smith Houses, we have had to prioritize the needs based on safety and the well-being of residents. So our first priority was replacing gas pipes which were done under this administration because the previous administration held us hostage because we refused to sign off on land lease. Our priority now is acquiring funds for pipe system and boilers in Smith houses. And we have families having to endure no heat or being overheated because of the boilers and pipes which are eroded. This problem begins to affect the health of residents, especially the elderly and children, including the residents that have cardiac or respiratory conditions. Finally, our question today is what investment the City Council and the New York State Legislator is going to do in supporting public housing residents given the budget cuts from Washington, D.C. to public housing in the city and the state of New York. Our government and city, our state and city government must invest in supporting our homes. And we demand as taxpayers and citizens of this country that you invest support the residents of public housing, not by creating another system of oversight, but by properly funding NYCHA for the improvement of the infrastructure of every building of NYCHA as needed, respectfully submitted. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairs, members of the council. My name is Nancy Ortiz. I represent 1,773 residents with a voting block of 2,300. First, I would like to address the elephants in the room. While the governor and the mayor, in their battle for budgetary control, have lost sight of the 400,000 NYCHA residents who continue to suffer. They continue to play ping pong with the 400,000 NYCHA residents who are the true victims here. Over the past few days, I have found myself in awe at the media circuits which I see before me. Again, the bickering in funding and finger pointing, losing sight of the 400,000 residents. If NYCHA is so important, Governor Cuomo, if you're watching, approve and release the $200 million allocated last year for NYCHA. Additionally, the state has continuously failed to acknowledge the request to Albany for funding, especially to return the line items for infrastructure, which continues to be ignored to this day. NYCHA's budget once again yet another set of steps to obtain funding to operate NYCHA's decaying infrastructure. By the time these steps have been completed, NYCHA has yet lost another development due to possible Department of Buildings deeming these sites uninhabitable. Oversight, clear, honest oversight. If the oversight and funding is the real ball here, then the state, the state controller and the city controller should be the oversights and appoint two independent forensic accountants to monitor the budgets and control. This is an honest oversight. This will remove the politics. Lastly, Walden, Mack, and Harron publicly stated that they represent 400,000 NYCHA residents. To make such a statement, they must obtain a written agreement of representation from each individual resident board member. They have not done this. Therefore, I state publicly, Balotic Houses is not in support of this lawsuit, and we have not signed on to this lawsuit. 
Just to give a very quick update, um, Velotic Houses was allocated $500,000 in 2015 for parks. It was, re it was released last week. Now we have to go through DASNY for, for the, uh, the sketches. I submitted to City Capital for 24 instantaneous hot water heaters, 54 mailboxes, 48 lobby doors, and I hope to get this funding for my development. I'm a very patient person. However, City provided me $500,000 in funding last year for my second park, and it has already been released, and we're already getting the blueprints for the park. So the difference in state and city, two years wait time. Thank you. Can I re just say really quickly that I also um, stand by um, the Lattic houses that Walton, um, um, Jacob Gardner does not um, represent the residents in Alfred E. Smith or the association. And so publicly, we do not agree with anything that they have done or said on behalf of the residents in public housing, especially for Smith houses. Chairwoman Ampri Samuel, members of the Committee on Public Housing, my name is Kadar Miller, and I'm the Senior Manager of Community Engagement at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, a member of the Cultural Institutions Group. On behalf of Lincoln Center and the Cultural Institutions Group, I want to express our continuing gratitude for the Council's longstanding leadership and support. I'm grateful to be here seeking the Committee's support of arts in public housing spaces including Lincoln Center's $15,000 speaker initiative request for our work with people facing housing insecurity. Also, on behalf of the Cultural Institutions Group, we request that in FY19, the Council baseline the $10 million received by the CIG in FY18 and allocate an additional $20 million to be split between the CIG and local program groups, providing a clear means of supporting the implementation of the NYC Cultural Plan. Guiding Lincoln Center's partnerships with public housing sites like NYCHA's Amsterdam Houses and transitional housing sites like the Women in Need Shelter Network, there's an ever-enduring truth. The arts are for the many, not for the privileged few. And now more than ever, our work with these public housing spaces stand in solidarity with the NYC Cultural Plan to advance equity by ensuring access to affordable, high-quality artistic experiences, especially in the context of community arts, with those in public housing and those facing housing insecurity. The Lincoln Center Community Artist Residency Program facilitates meaningful collaboration between artists and community members across New York City. Artists from various backgrounds come to public housing spaces people call home, not only to teach the skills of their art form, but to use art as a means of building an open community among diverse neighborhoods. This creative exchange is the foundation of building a community within public and transitional housing. These art spaces foster opportunities for individuals and families to connect with each other, expressing their hopes, their dreams, their fears, and facilitated by the world's leading artists and without regard to socioeconomic circumstance. Neighbors are able, able to become more than just strangers in passing hallways, and the rich cultural vibrancy of New York City is brought into the creation of art that can travel the world over showcasing the beauty and undeniable value of each and every person. In partnership with our CBO partners, the Community Artist Residency Program offers weekly workshop sessions at identified residency sites, including studio time, art visits, recruitment presentations, and field trips to world-class live performances in dance, music, theater, at Lincoln Center and throughout NYC, and culminating performance events at each residency site, as well as at Lincoln Center. And our concurrent exploration into the efficacy of our methods continuing, Lincoln Center Education will contribute research to the field that formalizes a model for implementing responsive community arts programming in environments in which people have experienced housing-related and more generalized trauma. By providing this platform for individuals truly where they live, Lincoln Center and its partnering artists and organizations can engage community residents in a new conversation around the role of arts in the lives of all New Yorkers, a conversation significantly enhanced and expedited with your backing. So to this end, we hope the committee will support Lincoln Center's 15,000 speaker initiative request for our work with people facing housing crisis. And again, on behalf of the Cultural Institutions Group, we request that in FY19, the council baseline the $10 million received by the CIG in FY18 and grant an additional $20 million to be divided between the CIG and local program groups. Thank you to the members of the committee and the city at large for your ongoing partnership. Hey, my name is Alex Rodriguez. 
uh, I represent myself and the many people like me in the low-income community. I discovered Pathways to Apprenticeship in Section 3 program through pure osmosis. Just by tagging along with a friend, I was able to change my life. Nigel Franklin from Fifth Avenue Committee forwarded my resume and application over to the Pathways to Apprenticeship program. I would later be accepted and guided by Dominique Bravo and Alvin Banks on a wide array of subjects such as financial literacy and history of labor unions, all while working towards getting accepted into a constitution or a construction trade. I wrote a speech and presented it on the last day of the program. George Fiola, a founder of a local paper, the Red Hook Star Review, was in attendance. He interviewed me, and after exchanging a few emails, I started to write the paper myself. Since then, I produced half a dozen publications and attended events all over the city. It was thanks to my affiliation with the paper that I was able to come here to City Hall for the first time and attend a roundtable discussion with the City Council Speaker, Melissa Mark. I remember standing outside after the meeting, looking up at the building and taking a second to comprehend how far I had come and how fast everything was happening. Thanks to Constellation Energy and the NYCHA Reese program for organizing a four-week study course, I was able to obtain the knowledge and more importantly, the confidence necessary to pass my apprenticeship aptitude test. Now I'm standing here as a first year apprentice and member of the Local 3 Electrical Union, all thanks to Pathways to Apprenticeship and most of all, all thanks to Section 3. I don't communicate much with the people in my neighborhood, but my hard hat and tool bag speak very loudly. You see, tagging along with friends and receiving a life-changing experience isn't rare in the neighborhood I come from, but it usually lands you in handcuffs or in a penitentiary, not in an apprentice program. I was quoted in a February issue of NYCHA Journal for saying, people in our communities are dealing with trauma. What other people read about in the New York Times and become outraged by, we experience firsthand. Together, thanks to Section 3, we are creating a new funneling system, one that helps us benefit ourselves, our family, and our communities, not Unicor and Geo Group. My main goal here today is to communicate that low income doesn't mean low potential. Low income doesn't mean low intelligence. There are gems hidden in these low income communities and I implore you guys to go digging. Section 3 has helped me start a lucrative career. Section 3 is helping me obtain a college degree. And perhaps the most fulfilling Section 3 has helped me make my mom very, very proud. I am willing to be a proponent for Section 3, but I am not willing to be an anomaly. Please, let's work together and help empower countless other people. Thank you so much for everyone's testimony and thank you, Mr. Rodriguez, for being here and sharing your story. I know you said your mother's proud of you. I'm super proud of you. <laughs> and you. Um, that's what we, that, so my whole goal is to make sure that the council um, speaks directly to your voice and making sure that we're sitting here talking about capital projects and you hear all these different things about building and development, but we wanna make sure that the young people in our community and that's going through the section three and now you're a member of local three, that you're actually working on these projects and you're able to provide for your family and your communities and we all build and grow together. So thank you again for sharing and uh, we're gonna be as supportive as we possibly can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And next we have the youth from the Youth Leadership Council. Up next, we'll hear from Renell Texara, Shanice Mead, Zachary Rumnett, Naomi, Naomi Johnson. No, that's not Youth Leadership Council. <laughs> Arielle DeCamp and four members of the Youth Leadership Council. Okay, there we go, yeah. <laughs> and 
And for the record, I have to say this Youth Leadership Council are all members of the Brownsville community and um, very excited about you being here. <laughs> you can state your name and then. Hello? Hi, Gucci. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Zachary Remnant. I live in Van Dyke Houses and I lived there for 15 years of my life. I play basketball and football. I am an entrepreneur, I sing, I dance, I rap, I model, and I am a Nike Youth Ambassador. I focus on keeping my music and clothing brand business going so I can continue to be my own boss. I am currently Youth Leadership Council President for NYCHA Zone 7. I am a youth leader because I want to make my community a better place. I have always lived in NYCHA, so it's, it is our home, our place, and where I am from. I would love to see an updated environment with cleaner hallways and courtyards, better sidewalks, and other improvements. I would also like to see more programs and jobs and put in my community. And I, I would also like to um, thank Chairwoman Alika, Alika, oh, I got a little tongue twist. Alika Embry Samuels for hosting the event for the seniors last Thanksgiving. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, good afternoon, my name is Ronald Texara. <clears throat> thank you for allowing me to testify before you today. Uh, I've lived in Van Dyke Houses at NYCHA for 12 years. <clears throat> uh, I'm on the Youth Leadership Council uh, because I want to make my community look and feel decent. Uh, our top advocacy priority is beautification. Uh, I want people to be able to plant and garden in the spaces around our buildings. Um, growing up, uh, I used to help my uncle with his vegetable garden at his house. Uh, I would love to see NYCHA residents be, <clears throat> be able to grow their own healthy vegetables and spend time outside together. <clears throat> I think gardening is something healthy for people to do together while also taking pride in our community. Uh, to me and my family, NYCHA is made up of people who want to improve our environment. I hope one day NYCHA residents are able to spend more time gardening outside to improve health and pride in our community. Thank you for your time and attention today. Good afternoon, my name is Shanice Mead and I live in NYCHA Cephalo Houses in Brooklyn and I lived there for the last 13 years. Ooh, I'm too short for the um, Last year I got to meet Miss Councilwoman, Miss Alika and P. Samuel. Uh, see, last Thanksgiving, we volunteered at the Senior Center. It's good to see you again. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate you. Um, to me, night two means stable, st stable housing in the community. Um, just to know more about me when I'm home, when I'm bored. I like to read, and write, draw, hang out, you know, in the community, when night night community. Um, more about me when I'm older, I want to become a famous illustrator and a famous pastry chef. Um, this past year, I joined the Youth Leadership Council, and my favorite thing to do with YLC is to volunteer with seniors at a community center. Um, I serve on the Youth Leadership Council because I want to make my community, Brownsville, a better place to live at. And lately on the news, I've been hearing how nature, funds and money, limitations, and I hope it'll get figured out because everybody needs some money. Um, because I would like to see better apartments and buildings and parks, everything. Yeah. I always like to see health issues, less, less health issues and violence, and more guardian and more employment for teenagers. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Good afternoon, my name is Ariel DeCamp. Thank you, Councilwoman Amphrey Samuel and other council members for having me here today. I have lived in NYCHA Van Dyke, NYCHA's Van Dyke for 15 years. My personal goal for the future is to be more of a contributor to our society. Right now, on my spare time, I play basketball and I stay on top of the news and current events. Last fall, I started to read a lot about NYCHA's budget issues and problems in the newspaper, and also I saw it on TV. Hearing NYCHA's budget motivated me to join the Youth Leadership Council in my area. 
I joined because I think I can make my community better by advocating for things that we need. I would like to see NYCHA become more of a welcoming community, and I would like to see restoration, less violence, and more unity. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for your testimonies. I just warm my heart, and I look forward to working with you in the district and in the community on um, your agenda and what you would like to see happen. Thank you so much, and this is huge. You guys are awesome. If there's any way that we end today's hearing, it is with powerful youth. Um, I am so proud of you. I am proud to serve here as a council member, but I'm even more proud when we can see the fruits of our labor. We do this work for all of you, and I want you to be encouraged. There are so many young people, many of your classmates that live in your community that don't see this work as being important, and we need you to help us. We need you to be our ambassadors to talk about the Youth Council and the great work that you can do, the powerful impact you can make. Um, it shouldn't just be reactionary, right? So today there were thousands of young people that walked out of school in demonstration of what's been happening across this country with gun violence. But even if we're not talking about gun violence, we can talk all the time about things that young people go through every day, right? It doesn't have to be reactionary, but it can really be preventative. So I am thankful and I'm so glad that there are still representatives here from the New York City Housing Authority to see you young people in action because I'm encouraged on the days when I feel like all of the work we're doing, the adults in the room that can't get along, I look at our young people and it gives me hope. It gives me hope that we're doing the right thing. When we fight, when we yell and scream for money, for boilers and roofs, so we can improve the quality of life, it's for you. So that you can be safe in your communities, so that you have a better future than we do. So I am just so grateful to see you here with these bright yellow shirts on talking and you know just articulating your points and I really really want to encourage you yes sometimes things seem really bleak sometimes it seems like really dark like we won't ever see light but I just want you to be encouraged that there are good people that are trying to do the right thing there are adults in the room that get along we like each other we work together and we're not always fighting right sometimes the media gives you the bad version and there's really a lot of great work that's being done internal that you may not see so I just want to congratulate you on being a part of the youth council I want to encourage you to be our ambassadors whether you live in Van Dyke Brownsville houses or any other parts of Brooklyn please help us so that we can help more young people and we can have this as a movement, right? Think about the impact that four young people can make. If you talk to four people and you talk to four people, that's a message. That's a powerful message. And a lot of times, you know, young people don't listen to adults, but they may listen to another young person. So we need you even more to be our ambassadors. So I want to thank you for coming. And I also want to commend you too, because you like you typed up your testimony, that's great. Sometimes we get handwritten notes, so it just shows professionalism, and I just wanna say thank you for that. Thank you for being here, and please keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. We have just one more panel, so can you wait at the back? We would love to take a picture with you. <laughs> so, our last panel, next we'll hear from Maggie Petway, Naomi Johnson, and Carrie Gatson. Carrie Gatson from Fury, Naomi Johnson from Howard Houses, and Maggie Petway from Edenwall. This is the last. Okay, panel, you're taking us home. <laughs> I expect you to top the Youth Council. <laughs> Okay, so when you start, just state your name, and we'll hear from everyone. Thank you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow, that's pretty loud. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
My name is Maggie Petway, and I am the Vice President of Eden Walls Resident Council. I was asked to come here today to make a statement regarding my time in Eden Wall Houses and how these repeated budget cuts affect my life, my son's life, and the many residents of this development. I have lived in Eden Wall Houses for 47 years. And just to give you a little of my personal history, I've worked every summer since I was 14 in this very development. Began working after school at age 17 and then full time at age 20. I've worked at two law firms, one as an intern and the other as a full time employee for four years. I am currently employed as a paralegal in city government. My official civil service title is administrative manager at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development for the last 30 years. I live in this development with my son. He is 22 years old and a college student studying media graphics and digital design. My immediate neighbors are a retired couple in their 90s. Both are ill with the usual plagues that old age can bring. There's a sick elderly woman who's in a wheelchair and is taken to dialysis two to three days a week. And there's a woman in her late 70s who took in foster children and has now seen her last child enter college. I could tell you about many of the other people that live in this development, people I see monthly at the resident council meetings, those who have disabilities, those who have children with disabilities, the infirmed, the elderly, and those making it to a meeting after working all day. NYCHA is their community. Over the years, I've watched how budget cuts have slowly caused decay less maintenance workers to handle repairs in a timely fashion, reduced funding for roof or boiler repairs, less building cleaners to handle janitorial duties, less materials for mold and lead plaster remediation, windows that are corroding and falling apart, and working appliances that are almost impossible to get. I saved vacation money last year but had to spend it purchasing a working refrigerator after receiving two defective ones, and I use the balance to pay my son's student loans. It angers me when I hear that the current presidential administration is talking about reforms to eliminate the deductions given for elderly, disabled, and for children for fa family compositions that lower the income for the household. It means that my elderly neighbors may have to choose between their heart and pressure medications and paying rent. Also, under this administration's rent reform proposal, they would increase tenant rent from 30 to 35 percent. This enrages me. A person making minimum wage or anyone just barely getting by could have their entire lives thrown into turmoil. How about the single mom who lives across the street, has been working on her job for three years, has not been given a raise, and one of her children is autistic? Should this resident have to choose between buying shoes for her ch children and paying 35% of her income on top of losing the deductions that make rent for her apartment fairer? And, when we he and then we hear in the news about the same agency spending thousands on new furniture on the backs of the poor, the disabled, children, and the elderly is beyond unfair, it's cruel. Housing policy is complex and costly from subsidies to tax credits, and from tenant advocates to landlords, sometimes they work in harmony with one another, and other times working in total opposition. We have a larger problem in this country than we could hope to solve in one or two hearings. I know that smarter people than me have tried to figure this all out and failed, but what I do know is that you don't make a bad situation worse. You don't reduce funding to an agency already on life support, and you don't kill the hope of many that are barely hanging on. I have to be honest, I didn't want to attend the hearing today. I've seen these before. People come, plead, pour their hearts out, and the tenants never get what they want or need. In general, just more of the same political banter about budgetary constraints and limitation. What this boils down to is that rent, food, health, and medical costs keep going up and service and quality of life go down. I'm here today in hopes that we can stop playing politics 
oppose rent reform, and ensure enough funding to get NYCHA's residents' needs met. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Naomi Johnson. I have lived in NYCHA's Howard Houses for 38 years, and I have served as the president of the Howard Houses Tenant Association for the past seven. Thank you, Chairwoman Alika Amphrey Samuel and the members of the City Council for allowing me to testify before you today. I am here today to talk about two major threats to the NYCHA community, lack of capital operating funding and threats of rent reform at the federal level. As you know, NYCHA has been chronically underfunded, which has created major infrastructure problems for Howard Houses. In fact, the chronic underfunding of NYCHA has made my position as president of the Tenant Association very challenging. I am constantly hearing from residents about what needs to be fixed or replaced, why we do not have cameras, with heat and hot water being the top complaint. In my role, I have been advocating for security and basic infrastructure work but there has not been enough resources available. Capital investment into Howard Houses is long overdue, and I know our development is not alone. At the federal level, level NYCHA is facing threats of a major budget cut and potential for rent reform, which could raise the tenants' rent from 30% to 35% of their income. Rent reform would also eliminate important deductions like child care or medical expenses. Working families rely on their deduction for child care. Seniors on a fixed income would also be affected. Eliminating these deductions would also increase the rent for working families. How do we expect them to make ends meet? Many residents in the development, families, seniors, and others, would not be able to pay the increased rent, and I believe they will become homeless. They certainly would not be able to afford a market rent unit in New York City, and many of them may not have a family safety net or anyone they could stay with. In these cases, all that is left to enter the city is to enter the city's shelter system. This is not what we want for our vulnerable seniors and families. It is essential that the City Council ensures that NYCHA receives the funding they need to keep providing services and protecting affordable housing. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for all the work that you've done, and thank you for the beautiful youth, their energy, their desire, their the need to succeed and to, to enjoy the, t the other life, part of life, the talents, that they, they have a choice. I, I work as a J-51 processor, so I walk through New York City and I see buildings that I worked on in better condition than the NYCHA <coughs> buildings. I, you know, I, I go in them, I see them. There should be no difference between not walking down Bond Street or Hoy Street, and I walk past a building that I worked on to see it's still standing in good condition. And the standard that when I worked, I had to maintain a standard. I could not process a building if it had a violation. These standards I would like to see for NYCHA. The controller has recommended that, you know, certain things that would help to improve NYCHA's accountability. I would like for the barriers that are in place within NYCHA's daily operating system to be removed so it does not frustrate the resident, so they complain more. So they feel that when they complain, their voice is heard, that no institution or no person is greater than the Constitution 
and that these, that the system of checks and balances within, this con within the Constitution will avail, even though it may take time. And I'm thankful for the City Council and everybody who are starting to hear the voices of NYCHA. And there's so many people, the statistics of the number of complaints is not accurate because there are many people who do not complain because they've been frustrated so much that they say there is no reason because nobody is listening. But you, the city council, and all the other people are hearing their voice, that you're showing that they have a voice, that they are people, that they deserve a decent way of life. And thank you so much for the youth that's showing hope. And I'm proud, even though I don't know them, I am happy and proud for them, and that's it today. Well, thank, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I just want to say also thank you so much, Sarah, for all of your hard work. Um, this concludes our preliminary budget hearing for FY 2019 with the Committee on Public Housing and the Capital um, for Expense and Capital Budgets. And, Thank you so much.